Hi everyone. The time is now 1 o'clock Eastern. I'm going to pause for about 30 seconds just to let some more people join. I see the number coming up. Number of participants rising. Give people another minute and we're going to get started with some welcoming remarks and housekeeping. Okay, let's get started. Welcome everybody and hello. I'm Beth Grosso and I'm the Director of Training here at the Center for Start Services. I'd like to welcome you all to the final day of the December Start Virtual Orientation Series. This has been a three-day series designed to introduce you to the Start Model's core principles and approaches. December is our third and final installment in the series. Tuesday session focused on understanding trauma, intellectual and developmental disabilities and mental health. Wednesday session took information that we learned on Tuesday and did a deeper dive into how it's implemented through trauma informed care approaches. And today's session will be an opportunity to view and discuss the recently released documentary film about the start model entitled now we have hope the strength of the start community. I did want to give a brief note about some inclement weather. Some of you might know that the Northeast is currently experiencing quite a significant so snowstorm. We have about a foot here already. Um, and that's impacting our operations team, which is based in New Hampshire. We're not anticipating any interruptions to today's session, but we want you all to know that we are prepared. Should we experience any technical difficulties today, please know we have a plan and we will work diligently and efficiently to minimize any disruptions. And as always, we appreciate your understanding and patience. All right, so today's session is going to run from 1 to 5 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Pacific. There'll be a 30 minute break between 3 and 3.30 Eastern or 12 and 12.30 Pacific. Today's session format differs a little bit from our first two days, so we're going to do a careful review of the agenda. We're going to begin with an introduction to the start film with Dr. Wigley and filmmaker Dan Habib. We'll then watch the first of three segments of the film entitled Shelley Strength Spotting. That will bring us to about 1.40 p.m. Eastern or 10.40 Pacific, at which point we will transition into our first of three breakout sessions. We'll spend 25 minutes in our breakout session and then return back to the group for a brief 15 minute large group discussion. We'll then watch the second segment of the film, Logan Finding His Purpose, which will bring us to our break from 3 to 3.30 Eastern, 12 to 12.30 Pacific. When we come back from break, we'll move into a 15 minute breakout session that corresponds with Logan's segment of the film. We'll then have a 15 minute large group discussion and then move into viewing the third and final segment of the film, Rosa Shining Her Light. You might be noticing the pattern by now. So following our viewing of Rosa's segment, we'll have a 15 minute breakout session and then we'll wrap up today's session with one final large group discussion. Now would be a great time to download both today's session guide and the FAQ guide on our web page, and there'll be a link in the chat. The FAQ guide will help you to easily navigate each of today's breakout sessions. Now on to some general housekeeping. Please keep your camera off and your microphone muted while the pre-recorded presentation airs. Please use the chat feature for on-topic comments or questions, which we will address as we're able. Closed captioning is available. To activate closed captioning, please look for the CC button displayed on the bottom bar of your Zoom screen. And if you experience any technical difficulties during today's session, please send a chat to Anne Marie Ashford or Marianne Alsop. I'd now like to introduce today's presenters. Dr. Karen Wigley is a clinical psychologist with over 30 years of experience working with people with autism and other developmental disabilities in their families. As the Associate Director of the Center for Start Services, she facilitates program implementation, provides expert training and consultation services, and conducts research. 
Dr. Wigley is also a founder of and clinician at the Chattanooga Autism Center in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Dan Habib is the creator of the award-winning documentary films, including Samuel, Who Cares About Kelsey, Mr. Connolly Has ALS, and many other short films on disability-related topics. Dan Habib is a filmmaker at the University of New Hampshire's Institute on Disability, and his newest documentary, Intelligent Lives, examines our society's narrow perceptions of intelligence. He is a six-time New Hampshire Photographer of the Year, and his freelance work has appeared in Time, Newsweek, and the New York Times. In 2012, Habib received the Champion of Human and Civil Rights Award from the National Education Association, and in 2013, he received the Justice for All Grassroots Award from the American Association of People with Disabilities. In November 2013, Dan Habib delivered a TED Talk titled Disabling Segregation on the Benefits of Inclusion to Students Without Disabilities. In 2014, Dan Habib was appointed by President Barack Obama to the President's Committee for People with Intellectual Disabilities, a committee that promotes policies and initiatives that support independence and lifelong inclusion of people with intellectual disabilities. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Wigley and Dan Habib. Thanks so much, Beth. Hi, and thank you, Beth. Thank you for the warm introduction. It's so nice to see people here on day three. Thank you guys for coming and staying with us so many days here. I'm going to share um, some slides with you now. All right. So today, um, as Beth mentioned, we have quite a full um, schedule. Um, watching all three segments of our film, along with having a little bit of time for discussion after each and then reporting back to the larger group. I tried to calculate the time as best I could. We'll see how that works out. Um, but we will take our break at our scheduled time regardless. But wanted to point out that this film and the review guide are available on the Center for Start Services website. Please do use this. Um, please access this and use it whenever you need to. Um, and let me explain why we even made this, um, not just because it was super fun, because it was. It was a really wonderful experience to be able to do this. It was fun because it, it let us slow down and take time and focus on a lot of our successes and what things have gone well. Um, and it was just really fun to work with Dan and for me to learn a lot about filmmaking and how you, um, how you decide what to show and how to show it. But why we did the documentary was because we wanted another way of demonstrating the effects of START programs around the US. So we have a ton of data in our database that is used every day by our START coordinators and START teams to help them understand what they're doing and how it's impacting the person and the systems they're working with. It's, it's ongoing feedback loop about what we're doing and what we need to do differently tomorrow. Um, and we use that data to develop our evidence base for, for in research um, just by accessing all this data that we have. But we were missing um, some of the direct stories about the impacts of START on, on people and their families um, that we serve and the communities as well. So we wanted to really highlight that. We, we had written stories, we, had, we would tell stories, but to be able to see it from the perspective of the people that we impact, um, was really a great opportunity for us. We were excited to be able to do this. Karen, should we be seeing something on our screen right now? Yes, you're not? No. <laughs> I'm glad you <laughs> said that. I am very glad you said that. All right. I think it's because, let me, let me try again. And think that it's because this went away. My Zoom screen got completely taken away. So let me do it this way first. Okay. Do you see there we it go. now? We're rocking and rolling. All right. Well, this was the one slide that I just talked about. Um, so 
how how we developed this documentary. What did we do? I'm going to let Dan kind of talk about this as a filmmaker. Sure. Thanks, Karen. And hi, everybody. It's really great to be with you today. Um, I love films. I love making films. And I really love when films are put to work in the great work that you all are doing or are going to be doing. So um, I'm here to introduce the films. And then for the rest of the day, you guys are going to take it and run with it with discussion with this great star team. So. When I start to develop a documentary, there's a lot of background work that goes into that, a lot of research and planning. And we wanna make sure that we hit on all the key themes that are gonna really be important when you start showing this film in your communities. So back in October, 2017, I can't believe it was that long ago, but it was, uh, we started meeting with START program directors all around the country to ask them, you know, what are the key values of START? What are the key practices? What kind of ideas and insights would you want us to show um, in a film like this. So we started with the need and, and with the key core values and messages that start embodies. And then we tried to build our filming plan around that. So between December 2017 and July 2019, we continued to have these conversations and we started researching different programs and where they really had strength. Um, we did our own strength spotting, which you're gonna hear a lot about today in terms of the programs around the country. And we met with specific programs um, that we felt, and they, these ended up being programs in North Carolina and Texas and New York, as you'll see, that we felt um, embodied some of the key elements that we wanted to show through these films. We work with these local STAR programs to identify participants, the people they serve, the staff that work at start, uh, the STAR programs, and really dig into their stories ahead of time, make sure we had full buy-in and full participation and enthusiasm from the people. We had pre-meetings where we would do Zooms, we, uh, meetings with some of the clients, some of the people that start folks work with, uh, some of the guests, and prepared them, you know, told them what to expect. We then organized these film visits, which lasted two to three days in each location, and we spent a lot of time following um, the, the people who do the great work that, that are that's being done throughout the start. And obviously, we had to get all the proper agreements and consents in place as well. So you can uh, go to the next slide. Uh, we also thought a lot about the audience for a film like this. I, Karen probably is tired of hearing me say this again and again, but I wanted this film to be accessible to everyone. I didn't want the language, and actually I say I, but we really as a team, didn't want the language to be overly clinical to the point where people's eyes would glaze over, right? We wanted to put these films in front of a family that was considering working with START or participating in, in one of START's programs and, and get it right from the get-go and understand it. Uh, we also want them to be accessible by open captioning them and by audio describing them, which means you'll hear sometimes someone describing what's happening visually in the film so that if somebody was visually impaired or blind or wasn't reading, um, they could still take in the film very effectively. Because if you're not reading and there's informational text, you know, you're not gonna see that. And then we thought about who those specific key uh, audiences were. And those could be anyone from potential funders for your program locally. Obviously, a lot of start programs have to seek out additional funding locally through, um, you know, state organizations or, or foundations. Uh, we wanted clinicians to really get a lot out of this film. We most certainly wanted families and the people that start serves first and foremost to make the to make good use of these films and, and uh, be excited about them. Certainly, developmental disability providers and behavioral health providers. We wanted to make the film accessible and effective for them and finally managed care organizations and hospitals, and really the general public. I mean, every film I make, I want the general public to see it, and I think Start's been doing a great job of getting this film out there, but with your help, it's gonna get out there to a lot more people, these audiences, and more. So Karen, I'll let you take it with the next slide. Okay. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to tack on to what you said, Dan, that I really am um, wanting all of our new team members, so many people are here um, from, new teams, I wanted you, and, and older teams, um, if you are here as well, wanted you to remember that this is really a good way to introduce and help describe what your teams do. I know it's hard when you're new and, and nobody in the system knows what you're doing or really understands your role. And so they keep thinking, this is what you do. No, this is what you do. These films can really be used to help educate different people in the systems, families, like, uh, you know, like Dan already talked about, who aren't sure if they want start services because we're not really sure what you're doing. So you can pick and choose which of the three segments of this film um, best describe perhaps what you're providing to a specific person. 
Um, and, and all three segments can be really helpful for things like um, case managers slash service coordinators or ISCs um, to help understand what your role is. So I just kind of want to plug that again. I'm going to keep plugging that because I really do think it, it takes, as everybody who's been with START for a while, it takes even people doing the work close to a year before it clicks in your head of what you're actually doing um, and how it all fits together really clearly. So I, I just love that we have the opportunity to show it through film in a very abbreviated way. So what did we, what did we ask these start program directors? Um, like Dan said, who do, who we want to use this with? Um, and what we asked, what really interesting things that came out of this, we asked, so how have the values of START impacted your program's development? Um, and a lot of what we got was about the program development, but also about personal development um, and personal wellness for the people who are on START teams. And that was a real rewarding thing to hear about. Um, we asked about what the different teams did that were innovative um, in applying the START model. So as many of you know, the START model, it is a model and we have certain prescribed tools that you use and ways that you do things and orders in which you do things generally, but it really has to fit within the exi existing system. So it looks very different in um, California, maybe Northern California than it does in New Hampshire. Um, because we're going to, it fits into whatever system already exists, right? We have to meet everybody where they are and figure out how does this work well here. Um, so we, we wanted to find out what have some of these teams done that's innovative um, and, and really interesting to show. We asked which of the START principles guided their program the most through their years of implementation. Um, so what, did, what stands out to them as sort of the most important key ingredients that we wanted to make sure we highlighted and, and demonstrated through the making of the film, um, as well as the, the practices and the greatest impact on your community. The, the themes that came about, I think Dan was gonna talk about our themes. Oh, no, he wasn't, I was, sorry. <laughs> I think we talked about that. Um, so number one, it, it, by far, everybody talked about the biggest theme that, that the START teams had brought was hope. Um, hope to teams, hope to families, hope to community members. So remember that typically when, um, when we're asked to come in and help somebody develop a START team, it's because things are not going well for someone. And most people who support that person are going, we don't know what to do. And a lot of times uh, it's very frequent for those people and those systems to feel undermined and defeated because they just, and frustrated, you know, burnt out because they don't know what to do to be helpful. So by breaking things down and focusing on what's right and um, using really solutions-based um, uh, strategies, turning things around so that we can find new and innovative ways to do things. That's, that's what the biggest impact was by far. Also enthusiasm, um, helping to, to make, make things more positive. Obviously the humanity of the people we work with, um, bringing that, that's the center of everything we do, right? Is, is paying attention to everybody's humanity. Um, the training and expertise and ongoing learning community of which you are all now a part. This is part of our learning community. We have ongoing um, opportunities to train and learn and we are all learning with you and always growing. Um, language, really important. Our language is very important. How we talk about people, how we talk about systems, families is really critical. And that's a big part of START training really. Um, as, as you're going through this that you'll notice. Um, flexibility. So yes, we have a model. And I know a lot of new team members want to know what do I do exactly when and exactly how and, and we go, 
it depends. It has to be clinically relevant. It has to fit this situation. And you need to look at the data you already have to kind of help guide that. Um, another big piece of it is our, our network and camaraderie. Like it would be really nice. We are doing these orientations because we can't travel because of the pandemic. Typically, we would have gone to the states where there are new programs and done this live. Um, and we're doing our best to sort of replicate it as best we can with things like breakout groups and discussions um, to, to be able to continue to provide some of that. But when we come back live, um, we, we look forward to, to, to that day. <laughs> um, and the strengths-based approach. And a lot of these things, right, you've heard through the past two orientations, us talking about a lot of these factors um, and PERMA. Um, so we'll talk about that. And, and importantly, again, it was the impact on the people we work with and on ourselves. So a lot of the START team members talked about how their life improved because of what they learned through using positive psychology, solutions, focus strategies, and systemic thinking. Thanks, Karen. Um, we're almost at movie time, so stay tuned, grab your popcorn. We're just about there. Or make some <laughs> during the break if you don't have any handy. Um, but uh, we, so we're going to start the first of three segments. Uh, when you go onto the START website, you'll see this posted, and I'm sure we'll be posting the link to the full film in the chat, and you'll have plenty of follow-up to, to know where it is. But the, the film is one big chunk. It's about 110 minutes. But the film is really designed to be shown in three segments of, of closer to 20 to 25 minutes each. So that's the way we're going to show it today. And that, we think, makes it a more manageable teaching tool and public awareness tool. So um, the first segment that we're going to show is called Shelley Strength Spotting. And uh, with each of these segments, we've tried to set up some initial questions for you to think about as you're watching the film. And if you're the kind of person that likes to watch and chat and share your thoughts in the chat while the film is playing, go for it. Uh, we, that'll be a fun thing to do. If you're the kind of person that just wants to tune in on the film and not worry about the chat and then close the chat box, whatever, whatever you prefer. Um, but either way, I hope as you watch this segment, uh, you, you think about some really key things that we are trying to highlight in this first segment of the film. Um, Shelly is the start staff, the coordinator who's featured in the film, but she works with a young man named Braxton and a mom named Suzette, who are both amazing, wonderful people that we got to know and work with down in North Carolina. And so we want you to think about what are Braxton and Suzette's strengths that you see? What, you know, do your own strength spotting as you're watching this film, just like you'll see Shelly do in real time. Um, and then when do you see strength spotting using <laughs> Shelly, as we say, is kind of the star of this film, but there's other people as well that you'll see come into the picture, into the film that are also doing strength spotting. So, you know, you can, again, chat about that or just take note of it and think about it because in your, in your breakout discussions, you'll want to be able to share some of your thoughts on that. And then what impacts did you notice from the strength spotting? When, when Shelly particularly was doing strength spotting for Braxton or Suzette, how, what, what did you see come out of them? How did they react? And that's what we really tried to capture in this film. So um, we're gonna cue the film up in a minute. I'm gonna sign off. I'm gonna go play out in the snow. Not really, I wish. <laughs> we have about a foot and a half here in New Hampshire. Um, I mean, I've got some other things I've got to do. And, and also really the rest of the day is for you all to discuss and process and work with the START staff. So it's a real honor to be with you today. Um, and please, please, please put these films to work. That's why I made them. And, and with, with lots of uh, collaboration from Karen and many other people. So enjoy. Thank the you, Dan. Thank you. Yeah, I wish you could go play. I heard it's I 18 inches. Like, yeah, come on. Yeah, that sounds fabulous. Out. It's been a while. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Time. Stay warm. Thanks. All right. So, so as Dan said, please keep these, these three um, things in mind as you watch, um, just as a way to sort of guide you through what, a, what we intended for people to notice as they watch this segment of the film. And I think we are re indeed ready to show the first section. Now we have hope, the strength of the Stark community. Presented by the Center for Stark Services at the Institute on Disability at the University of New Hampshire. Many people with intellectual and developmental disabilities 
and co-occurring behavioral health needs are misunderstood, underserved, and underestimated. The START model was developed to improve access to mental health and crisis services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families. People referred for START services are typically in crisis, so START first helps to resolve an immediately destabilizing situation. This allows for hope and change going forward. Through positive whole person approaches, START helps people and their families to foster resilience, to overcome the inevitable stressors of life. START programs work with each person, their family, supports, and services to ensure that all have a common understanding of the person's strengths and abilities, in addition to their vulnerabilities and mental health needs. Now we have hope. The Strength of the START Community is a compilation of three short films about the impact START has had on people and their families in Texas, North Carolina, and New York. In this segment, Shelley Goodwin demonstrates the approaches a START coordinator employs to help people not only avoid crises, but gain health, build on their strengths, and live their best lives. Shelley, Strength Spotting. Oh, good morning. Shelley Goodwin, coordinator, oh, NC Start nice Central, shot, visits man. Braxton Utley at the Resource Center. Thanks. This is some awesome shots. Hey, fist bump. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. So you want it, you're ready to get, head home, huh? Is that yeah. what I heard you say? Yeah, I could, I could do a little bit of talking a little bit. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So um, what was your favorite part of the weekend? The, you... um, my favorite part of the weekend, um, you know, you. playing Uno and stuff. Playing yeah. Hanging out with everyone, yeah. right? And I and I, I would be selling candles pretty soon. Yes, talk talk to me about that. You have saved up so much money yes. for making your candles. Yes. Braxton has utilized the NC Start Resource Center where our guests come in and work on goals. Mm -hmm. There's very much a social piece to it, but it is very therapeutic too. Good well, morning for basketball. Hey Shaniqua, Courtney. Braxton shoots a basketball. Oh, Bra oh, you were robbed, Braxton. <laughs> Director Jelaine Baker. The role of a start coordinator is to see beyond just the decrease of crises, but to say, where are their strengths? How can we use their strengths to um, get them engaged in more things that make them happy? That's yeah. awesome. I'm proud of you for Thank that. You. That's really cool. Yeah. Saving up money for your... For my camcorder. Your camcorder. Um, almost, almost, some, almost gonna look like Sony, but it's a, it's a little bit smaller. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. I'm really proud of you. And your parents are too. Yeah, they said you but I want to. I want to get the big one, just like it. Almost look that that one. The happier you are, the less crises you're probably going to have because you're staying excited and involved in things that you care about. I'm just really proud of the way that you've been saving up your money yeah. and things that you created with your own hands. Yes. Yeah. When we identify our strengths and then can use those strengths in the community, um, we build resilience. And they had music playing and everything. They did. Clinical director Jill Hinton. The role of the START coordinator is initially to um, do assessment, figure out what's going on, not only with the individual, but with the system that's surrounding the person. More exercise. And figure out where there may be gaps, where there needs to be more linkages, where we need to connect parts of the system. <laughs> Braxton high fives a woman. A strong START coordinator has a lot of empathy and can stay calm in the midst of a really big storm. Jelaine. We talk a lot about start coordinators providing oxygen for families, and sometimes that's just being a peaceful presence. Oh, great. Hey, Is dad. your mom here? And my dad. A car arrived. Yeah. Yay. I know you're yeah. ready to see him. Yeah. Tell him about your weekend. Yeah. I'm going to try to chat with them a bit, too, if that's okay. Yeah. My caseload has 25 people, and when I start working with a new person, um, what I want to do immediately is get to know them, but also get to know who is in their system of support. Hey, Thomas. Who are the people that are closest to them, their family members, their psychiatrist, care coordinator that oversees their services through the MCO. His father, Thomas Utley, joins them. Day programs, school. Was it five in a row or something? Yeah. At he least, basketball. yeah. He liked yeah, basketball. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 
And he also had a great weekend and, yeah. you know, connected with everyone like he always does. And yeah, that's good. you enjoyed that. Um, we had an artist in the house, huh? Yeah, yeah that's pretty yeah. cool. Did you do any cooking? I did a little bit. You did? did you yeah. Help with I cooked some, some um I cooked some rice and everything. Oh good. Thank you for and that. And some vegetables. You know, I'm trying to trying to get my life together too. I'm gonna put my life on the track. Mm-hmm. So, well, you're you're doing a great job. Yeah. Yeah. And it takes people around you too, right? Yeah. We all need some support and Yeah. We need per we need the person with me be all the way. Yeah, definitely. And your your parents are are great supports, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And you're a wonderful pop. Braxton pats his arm. Well, I thank you, buddy. Yeah. You my you one of my favorites. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, long, well, long as we um, long as we struggle, we got we got to go through it, pop. Yeah, right. that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We can make it. Yeah. We can make it. Yep, that's right. So stay focused. All yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. You gonna come back and visit us soon? Yeah. Well, good. So yeah. you feel good about everything when you're getting ready to head out? You yeah. feeling okay? A little bit. A little bit. Good. I so hope you, you have a good day. Got everything ready? It's, it's, Y'all it's, packed it's already, up? It's already packed up in, 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 in the house. Packed up job. and ready to go, huh? Yeah. Well, good. Yeah. In the house. Ooh, this is the artwork we heard about. Braxton opens a paper with anime style sketches on it. Ooh, oh my goodness, Braxton. I like how you can, it shows the different emotions of the characters. Yeah. These might be something we could use for people here that, um, that uh, pictures help, you know, them express their emotions and how they're feeling. Yeah, um, yeah very cool. Yeah. Friday, um, when I said what was for dinner, I was like, ooh, mac and cheese, Braxton. I, and I your dad was I like. eat it like once a month. Yeah. It's got to be small portions. Yeah. Part of what puts people in crisis is they've lost their sense of well-being. Their resilience is gone. Like Founder of the well, start model, be, Joan B. Beasley. Be an asset. And ways to build resilience are well-being practices. Health and nutrition, sleep, exercise, community, making a contribution. And if you don't think about it as exercise, you think about it as movement. Mm -hmm. All these things really help to promote people's well-being, to reconstruct their resilience so that they can go out in the world and succeed again. Thomas opens a door for Shelley and Braxton to leave the house, and he follows them outside. A Thomas's car. Have a great day, guys. See you tomorrow, Braxton. See you, bye. Maggie Robbins, clinical director, NC Start Central, leads a crisis admission review for the Resource Center. Hey everybody, thanks for being here. Um, we are going to be looking at a multidisciplinary look at a case that Shelley actually recently reactivated. This is an individual that Start worked with many years ago and know well, but she's had some pretty significant changes um, and challenges in the past several months. She has been in crisis um, and back and forth to the emergency room, has had a stay at Central Regional Hospital and um, medical director Dr. Roberto Blanco. I work with the coordinators in a variety of capacities in terms of the medical conditions, pharmacology, and often the genetic conditions that may be undiagnosed. Lots of loss and trauma, and so that's um, created uh, lots of instability, of course, and so she's been in We do our clinical case consultations weekly, and our nurse and doctor are so wonderful at just helping us think to ask the right questions and, and do those clinical assessments to try to learn more about if someone's being self-injurious and hitting themselves in the jaw, could they have a toothache? You know, there's just so many things that people might not be realizing that could be going undetected. Roberto. People with intellectual disability have uh, medical conditions at much higher rates than the neurotypical population, and that's due to a number of factors. Um, very long history. But she you know, there's also a high vulnerability to trauma. Um, some family members um, were murdered, and um, she also suffered the loss of um, her AFL provider, um, her guardian, and she saw her as mom and, and actually still calls her mom. Maggie. 
We're there to offer insight and help coordinators see the biopsychosocial uh, picture. The significant signs of sedation, um, stumbling, slurring her speech, um, her spoon couldn't meet her mouth. Maggie. Since this is such a complex picture, right. I do you mind if I take some notes That'd on the board? Great. We're gonna kind of map out Thank all the you. biopsychosocial pieces that are happening yeah. for her, um, especially because it sounds like medication is playing. Shelly. The biopsychosocial approach is really important because it highlights how many factors impacts an individual. So I'm gonna write notes as we're, we're talking through this, okay? Maggie writes on a whiteboard. Biological meaning, heredity, medical issues, their overall wellness. The psycho would be their emotional well-being, and then the social would be their environment, their social stressors, what comes into play in their everyday life. As sleep and yeah, so she could have like a delirium. You know, she yeah. could be having some type right. of medical issue going on, right. which could be combining with some of her medication changes and her sedation. Right. While she's here, we'll do, of course, we'll do the meds assessment to try to look at side effects right. of medications. Um, and we usually, you know, like to have a little time to get to know her before right. we actually complete that. Nurse so Kathy Clatile. Yeah. The other thing that I would like us to, Joan. to do is... To this start. clinical team of START is on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This allows people to have access when they need it in real time. And because of that, people know that there is help on its way and they're hopeful. Roberto. You know, there's so many barriers to care, and there's so much difficulty navigating the system, which is so complex. And a lot of these families just feel completely alone, and these coordinators go into their homes, and they hold the family's hands through the whole process, and they feel like someone cares. Really hopeful. Yeah, I was just going to say, I have hope. Shelley and Larry Wright, children's clinical coordinator, meet with Suzette Robinson. Yeah. Thanks for meeting with me today. Absolutely. Yeah. It's so good to see you again, Suzette. Thanks yeah. so much for helping call in. Of course. <laughs> yeah. I've been keeping Larry informed and everyone else on the team. We'll, we'll come up with some yeah. things, Suzette. We will. <laughs> yeah. It's not all on you. Yeah. I just Thank want you to know that. Yeah, yeah. I'm just kind of stuck. You know. Yeah. No, yeah. that happens. So he'll get so excited about going that I can't. Mm -hmm. like, that anticipatory calm. anxiety. It's I know. So OCD, I just can't, and it just gets so much, it gets intense. Colin at home, the young man bounces hard on a large inflated ball. Mm -hmm. Can't calm him down. I can get bit a hundred times, but I don't want him, like, I don't want him to get hurt like right. that. And I'm like, yeah. if he does it to me again, then. You know, I'm trying to protect myself right, of and, you know, things kind of happen. Yeah, you know, I want, yeah. want them to get hurt whatsoever, yeah, yeah. you right. know. <laughs> and one thing that you do, Suzette, that um, you have the ability to try to stay calm and neutral in those moments, and that's huge. Yeah. Yeah. How does he respond to um, um, just to, to, like, completing a task that's assigned to him? Like, does he take pride in, um, he gets, like, he tries helping to or? Uh, fast forward through it as, oh. <laughs> as quickly as possible. The team approach is so important. We are very in tune to each other's cases. You're identifying strengths within your teammates, and you learn from your teammates every day. <laughs> and always know you can reach out early stage, you know, just when you think something might be a little off yeah. at any point. Oh, thank you hey, for that. We're, we'll all, we're all learning together. Because it's right? not always a positive yeah. thing that I'm in. It's just, right. a, you know, day in and day out. Yeah. It's how to do what I have to do, yeah. you know. It's just a life-changing experience having an autistic mm -hmm. child anyway, right. you know. Yeah. Um, you don't have to have all the answers. That's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll sit down it's together. It's a process. Like, sure, don't. <laughs> it's a process. <laughs> it yeah. is. So yeah. we'll come up with something, yeah. things together, absolutely, yeah. and, and be mindful of Colin's, you know, skills and interests. Right. And you're the most strength-based person I know. You are. You <laughs> yeah. stay positive all the yeah. time. And well, I have to so, to help. You know. I can't be depressed about it. Oh. I have to. Um, I have to fight for him. You know. You do, he's, Larry. We're the ones in the system initially who have to kind of spark that faith that like things can get better for this person. Um, they are capable of success. It's our collective job to, you know, we're all going to work together to find out what that success is going to look like, but we have to have faith that it's possible. So when um, he was... <laughs> yeah. Oh. Shelly puts a hand on her shoulder. It's okay. Yeah. I just had a lot of anxiety. Yeah. You know, with him coming home. Yeah, of course. <laughs> And um, with his behaviors, it was 
is like, I don't know if I can do this. Yeah. You, know? yeah. And you guys were able to bring him here and um, tell, help mm -hmm. me reinforce, yeah. you know, who Colin is, how to deal with him. So when I come home, you gave me some tools to help him out. I would say the hardest part of my job is not always feeling like you have the right answers when you just really want to fix something. Hit his nose, I, like, I and then also it. seeing the prevalence of trauma. That's like, hard to see, and it's hard to not think really about, and to out. to put and that aside because too. you care about these people. Mainly, I don't want him to hurt himself right. when he gets overstressed and everything. But um, we'll collaborate and come together, and um, I don't want you to feel like you're alone. Yeah. We're going to come up with some ideas to help structure that time. Yeah. You know, create a schedule. Um, and does, does that sound okay? Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's like um, a relief, honestly. Because oh, I didn't know. Um, gosh, thank thank you so much for welcome. helping me, you guys. Of course. It's so I good to see you again. You? Oh. <laughs> yes. Shelly crosses a parking lot. Visit to Braxton's Transition Day program, A Small Miracle. Thanks for your time today. Oh, thanks for being here. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about Braxton's stay with us. He was a little more anxious, um, but overall, um, things went really well. But I just wanted to make sure that you guys knew that. She enters a job training room. I didn't know if you guys have any questions or um, any thoughts or any um, maybe updates on what it's looked like here recently. She goes to Braxton and two other men sitting at a table. Hi there. How you doing today? Yeah. I was going to say, I think the most recent intervention that we did, starting off with telling him what he's done right. Transition program instructor, Kara Callahan. Like the most recent one is he walked away from the situation. That was huge. Right. That was so big. And so I just like repeatedly complimented him on that. Um, and then once he was able to work through his feelings and we gave him space and he talked through it, um, then we were able to get back to reality and right. like what really happened. Right. That makes but sense. We've, we've seen a lot of growth and he's showing more um, humility and, yeah. and also leadership. Yeah. How are you doing, Kenneth? You okay? Yeah, I help in the kitchen. You know, something that's important to Braxton and that he brings up, the fact that he used to be employed, um, and that is certainly something that he takes pride in. Yes, for a while. Wendy told me. I'm so excited I'm already, for you. I already bought it. That's I, awesome. Yeah, I, I paid a good money for it. You must have done that yesterday. Wendy. So we're really trying to look at microenterprise so that he can continue to enhance his business. He's talked about candle design, the labels. See, you're talking lingo that I don't even know about. You're talking like a direct. And then bringing that to different fairs. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. It just shows how serious you are. I'm just going to ask you this. Um, um, you, um, I'm just going to ask you this. Will you will, willing to wait for me? Am I willing to wait for you? Work for you. Oh, How work much? for you? Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna have to talk to my boss, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I know you're gonna include some of your friends in your movie, right? Yeah, that's one of them. He points at one of the yeah, men at the table. Awesome. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. 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 Well, I'll always be your number one supporter. How about that? Yeah. I'm I was, always gonna be yeah. behind I gonna, you. I was gonna ask you this. Um, would you, you like would you like to be the makeup person? Ooh, the makeup person, yeah. like a behind the scenes person. That would be yeah. cool. Yeah. I know Wendy gets to maybe be the dragon in your movie. Yeah. Joan. We start out with people coming to us who have experienced dehumanization, humiliation, trauma, suffering, real suffering. And through our humanistic approach, it allows people to have access to the real core of who they are to work and play and love and share in life's experiences just like everybody else. Shelley. What I love about my job is instilling hope and kind of providing that immediate oxygen to support systems and individuals that may be feeling overwhelmed. She sits with Suzette and Larry in a pavilion at the Resource Center. I'm really lucky that every day I get to work with part of a, a model that has the same philosophies that I do. Oh. It's that positive support approach and making sure that people are part of their communities, that they don't feel alone. <laughs> you getting sick of me yet? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say that, but, but you're a great person. Thank you. It's been my pleasure to be able to, to have you in my life and work with you and your family. Directed and produced by Dan Habib. Executive producers, Joan B. Beasley, Karen L. Wigley, 
Edited by Francisca Blome. Filmed by Dan Habib. Production assistants, Lindsay Alsop, Karin Clausen. Sound and color finishing, Eric Masanaga, Shannon Mignaldi at Modulus. Special thanks to Shelley Goodwin, the staff at NC Start Central, Braxton Utley and his family, Suzette and Colin Robinson, a small miracle transition day program, Jill Hinton. This film was funded by the Center for Start Services at the University of New Hampshire Institute on Disability. More information at www.centerforstartservices.org. All right. Thank you, Marianne, for playing that. So hopefully you all got to see, you know, a little bit about what a start coordinator does. That's what we were trying to demonstrate with Shelly is showing the multiple different types of things a start coordinator may do throughout the day or week. Um, and you did see Braxton at the Resource Center. I just wanted to clarify for those of you who are not familiar with our resource centers, we used to call them respite centers, um, but that kind of uh, communicated something different in certain communities. So we renamed them resource centers. They are therapeutic environments for our guests to come for short-term stays um, where we can um, engage them in therapeutic activities all day long, as well as do assessments um, and help um, identify good uh, supportive interventions that we can then teach families or staff people in the community to use. Just a little clarification there. All right, let me share my slides again, please. There we go. Is that showing correctly, Beth? We're seeing the notes, the black, uh, the black background version, the note, the note slides. Let's just need oh, to switch. Okay, maybe. Here we go. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to have you guys uh, break out into discussion groups. And I want you to know that the discussion group that you go to this time, you're going to be in the same group all three times. So this first meeting, this first breakout is a little longer. You have a little more time so that you can introduce yourselves to one another. Um, and as, as Beth had described yesterday, we kind of want you guys to identify who is going to be your timekeeper, who will take notes for you and who will report back um, to the large group when we do have discussions. Um, so around this, this segment on Shelley, kind of want you guys to think about what, what is strength spotting? Um, have you used it? Um, and to what extent can it impact lives? And you can talk about this in the context of what you saw with Braxton and Suzette um, in the film. I also want you guys to think about, for those of you who are part of START teams, what situations might you use this particular segment of the film and with whom? Like, why would you use this part? Um, and, and what do you want to achieve by doing so, by sharing that? And I see that Beth put um, a link to these prompts so they can be downloaded for you guys. You can look at them um, throughout your group discussion. So I think we are ready now to break into groups. Okay, I just wanted to know if anybody needs uh, tra live transcription during their breakout session, when you see the pop up come up that prompts you to join your breakout room, click the later button that's going to keep you in this main room and allow us to provide live transcription for you. Thanks. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. For those of you who can hear me, this is still the main room, and we can use this as a breakout room. Hopefully, we have enough people in here to um, uh, have a good discussion. So I know sometimes people have to walk away, and then they just hang here. So I see you there, Matthew. How are you? I am doing well. How are you great. doing? I'm great. And then I see someone else turned on their screen. Anne Marie, are you with National? Yeah, I'm with the Center for Start Services in New Hampshire. Okay, I think you helped me with the CEU question last week and made my day. So thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. I don't know if it was me, but we're all here to support you. So I'm glad that uh, you got your answer. It's the magical CEU time of year for me. <laughs> yep, I get it. Let's see, do we have any more people in this main room? This is Raylene from East Bay Respite. Hi, Raylene. I see it's, kind of, I see it's very dark. I, can't, I know you, I can't see myself, so I know I'm here. <laughs> oh, I see hands. <laughs> but I don't have very good lighting. I don't have very good lighting at all. We can see you, Raylene. We can see you. And then there's someone else, T.W. Wright. Um, yes, my name is Tashina, and I'm from the Connecticut Start Group. Tashina, hi, How welcome. All right, so we have a few people. Donna, okay, so you guys don't need me. <laughs> you guys have the prompts. So I, if you have any questions, I, I'll be here. I'll be listening, and then I just keep an eye on all the other groups. So let me know if you have any questions. You guys want to just chat and introduce yourselves and get started. Okay. Well, I will go you all. My name is Matthew Eubanks, and I am the clinical director for uh, START in Tarrant County in Fort Worth, Texas. Hello. Hi there. So I'm Tashina. I'm a regional director from the Connecticut START. We are, are just starting up getting things running. I remember you, Matthew, from our training. Oh, nice. um, I work in the DDS sector of um, Continuum of Care, which is a nonprofit agency. Wonderful. Hi, I'm Jacqueline. I'm a START coordinator in the San Diego START California team. I'm Donna Stevens. I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee. I work for the Department of Intellectual Disability Services as a transition facilitator. Um, I think our closest start is in Chattanooga, Tennessee, hoping that you guys come towards the Knoxville area. It's nice to meet everyone. Donna, I have been quarantining so I can go see my in-laws in Maryville next week. So I'm headed your way. <laughs> That's where I live. Yeah, I live oh. in Maryville. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. My father-in-law mm -hmm. is the pastor of... Oh, a little church out, a Methodist church out from there now because I want to say it. I can't. But anyway, small world. <laughs> You're right. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's a little one called Fairview United Methodist. It's the oldest. It, well, not fair, uh, Middle Settlements. It's the oldest one oh. here in town. Oh, I'm going to have to look it up now. That's going to drive me crazy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Raylene Oko, and I'm with East Bay Respite. I am a supervisor for nonprofit um respite program um, and here in uh, California. And I'm just here just picking up, soaking up all that I've you know, recently learned about the START um, Center uh, services. So I'm really excited to be a part of, the, be a part of this process. Uh, my name is Conchita. I'm a nurse for DDS. I'm uh, connected with the regional project as well as the uh, CAST. Um, I'm here in California, thank you. My name is Paul Malanga. I'm with uh, DIDD in West Tennessee. I'm a behavior analyst. My name is uh, Lupe Loya. I'm a start coordinator here in Texas. Good 
If you guys want, I can take notes and share on our conversation. Great. That would be great. Okay. So are, are we working on which breakout? I'm sorry, which breakout room are we? Breakout one, two. You guys are the main room. You have no number. You are the no main room. Okay. Oh, okay. So should we start with strength spotting? Sure. So what did we observe in the film? Um, I like the integrative aspect of it. I just like the fact that SART incorporates the individual into their team and solicits their input and feedback and try to make them part of achieving their goals. Because it's not uncommon in the field that we make a lot of the decisions for the people that we serve. We think that we know best. And then um, when they're not responding in a manner that we think that they should, we look like we're at a loss for that. Huh? I like the person, I like the person centeredness, um, the, the approach that's being used and well, we're not start, but we, I'd like for us to uh, implement that. But at the same time, we use a person centered approach, even with the family circle of support. And uh, we try to tap into what uh, people's um, likes, dislikes, and watch and observe, you know, behavior analyst, everyone gets together and um, and figures out like what makes the person tick, you could say. And we try to um, put their world as much as possible around um, what they want and then train people to um, be able to um, implement that in their everyday life. I've seen that to be, uh, training specific for people. I think that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd like to I'd say I agree. Um, one of the things that stood out for me is that she was constantly uh, re-engaging conversations that she had previously had with Braxton. Like, you know, memory, bringing it back. Mm -hmm. Oh, we talked about that and that makes good sense. Mm -hmm. I like the way you did that. So she was constantly letting, her, letting him know that she remembers what they had spoke about previous, from, from their previous visit. Plus she always made really solid con eye contact. Mm -hmm. I mean, she let him know that I am so interested in what you're doing. And when he brings up something, she's like, oh yes, and did you? And then she'll, she'll kind of uh, ask an open-ended question that continues to drive their conversation into positive areas for uh, Braxton. So just her overall engagement and her techniques for doing that really stood out for me. Mm -hmm. I will say that I have loved using the strength spotting with our team, talk about using strength spotting with the people we serve, but um, but I think it's also helpful for us as colleagues too, because it models how it works and how it empowers people and how it sort of um, fosters connection. So um, in the first couple of clinical team meetings that I led, we did some strength spotting and that sort of thing. And it just helps people kind of prime that pump so that they're more able to do it with the people we serve after they do it with each other. And my other thought about strength spotting, I think it's so important to do, especially with people, um, well, with everybody, but I've found that so often people with IDD haven't been able to be the expert in many areas of their life. And, you know, they're, they may depend on someone where they live and 
someone's telling them what time to go to bed and what time to eat, that kind of thing. And so if we can spot their strengths and help them show that, um, it can be so empowering. Uh, somebody, it may have been Karen, said something in a training that I watched last week about, would it be empowering for you if somebody said, oh, you do laundry really well, or oh, you brush your teeth every day. And so I'm always encouraging people to find um, a deeper strength that really speaks to who they are as a person and not just um, an activity of daily living. But that's just some of the things that our uh, team has been working through when it comes to strength spotting. Uh, um, Mr. Raylene, and I, you know, I also thought it significant that um, Shelly would leave, uh, like provide Suzette with some tools and, and Suzette brought that up. I wanna, you know, thank you for the tools that I could use to, you know, work with him. Cause my fear is that he's going to hurt himself and I won't be able to really fully care for him if he does that. And, and it really put mom at ease that she had something to work with. And um, so it just felt like I saw her empowering mom as well, you know, to take on, you know, to take on the situation and let her know that she's, Hey, you're not alone. You're not, you're not in here by yourself, you know? So, and you can always reach out and call me and I'm there. And um, I think that was important to I let- I totally agree. I think it's very hard working in the field to allow people to take risks. And we think that we have to be overly protective and we're doing injustice because we're not allowing people to achieve their full potential. So for like, as a mother, you're naturally, you're naturally gonna be overly protective. You're gonna try to minimize those risks. So just you know, taking a position where he is given the opportunity to branch out and participate in things that are interested in him despite the risk. Yeah, yeah. And it's very hard to get, and you know, from my perspective, working in the residential sites, getting staff to buy into these situations and these models and to continue and carry them on because we can be overly enthusiastic and we can be, you know, but we're not the front line. We're not dealing with it you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. So when we see minimum progress, it's not necessarily the individual, it's more or less the way the techniques and systems are being executed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. And, 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 and Shelly does a fine job with Braxton when she, uh, like when she engages him, she also includes other, instead of talking about that, because I, I like the, the way she managed her conversations with Braxton um, because she moves gently from one situation and she at the same time encourages him to manage other parts of his life, you know? And so, um, so those things don't get left behind. Oh, mm -hmm. so, so, you know, you're doing this. So that means that um, when we talk about exercising, you know, we're also talking about movement and things like that. But and then she gently moves off in something else, so it doesn't become something where uh, it doesn't set up a stress mechanism in, in the individual. It kind of like kind of gently rolls off and gives them something to think about and to work toward. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone in the main room. We have a couple more minutes and then we're gonna be bringing everybody back just as a heads up. We haven't addressed the question of how you guys would use this film. Does anyone have any ideas on that? Well, well I think it's a great um, starting point. The film, you know, indirectly, it, it covers a lot without uh, being clinical, you know, cause sometimes you can turn people off being too clinical and I'm like, oh, that's gonna be, that's too heavy. I'm not ready for that. I can't do that. That's too much for me to handle. Um, but what, what the film does is give you small bites, small baby steps mm -hmm. that um, clinicians or coordinate, I mean, not co coordinators, but people can, 
start off doing because that's what drew me in to this. It's the small bites that I'm like, wow, this is this is something that I want to learn more about. So it you know it kept pulling me in and every layer of it became more and more interesting. And it's like, I can do this. I think I can do this. It doesn't seem so overwhelming or so um, uh, in depth that uh, I couldn't share it with a, a parent, you know, a, a parent. And it's like, this, you know, this is something that we can start, just take a look at this and so let's see where it goes from here. So I thought that was, it's a great first step tool you know, for family, to engage family or, um, you know, new new um, participants. This is David here in California. Um, I really agree with that as well. And what I like the most is the easy transition and uh, which is all embedded on focusing on the strengths instead of the, instead of the deficits. So I think to me, that's the main, main takeaway that uh, focusing on strengths instead of deficits is really empowering to these individuals and you could see it on the film. Yeah. Okay, yeah. we have people joining back in from their breakout rooms, main room. So we are going to wrap up the discussion as people come back together. Hey guys, looks like people are coming back. Oh, I'm, I love seeing faces. Yay, I'm not talking to myself anymore. I see people. So um, hopefully you had a little bit of time to kind of talk about what you saw and um, maybe how you would use that section of the film in the future. Um, I will probably just kind of how Jill and Ann did this yesterday. I'm just gonna ask, you know, a random group number and have you guys tell us what you talked about. So how about starting with seven? Is I represented in group seven. Hi. Yeah, I'll go. Um, what we talked about, we really talked about, well, we really like seeing the video, especially for us new, um, like where I am right now, um, Start hasn't officially taken off yet. So it was nice to see that video um, to kind of see and get more of a feel of, of how, how it flows with coordinators and the interaction. But we really talked about how important also as well, how important strength spotting is and how it's an ongoing process um, and how it can really boost the, the self-esteem, confidence and, and keep those... Um, good um, character strengths going um, and how it can really just change someone, really help and change someone. Um, so yeah, we kind of just went over those kind of things. Okay, great. Yes, it can. It's kind of surprising how just saying kind words and reminding people about, you know, what, what they have to offer us and others and themselves, it, it's very powerful. It really makes a difference. Particularly for people, somebody said this, um, I think in a group that I was lurking on, um, particularly for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who often hear about what's wrong. All right. How about group two? Hi, I'll be reporting Hi. for group two. Um, we had a lot of good discussions discussions. I'm from the same team as um, Fia, who just answered that last one. So it was good for me to have different people in my group who um, have started and gotten it off the ground a little bit and to hear some of the strategies that they've been using, um, really using strength spotting to reframe, especially with caregivers during the intake um, and look at even some of those challenges that come up, looking at them as maybe overuse of certain strengths and dialing back a little bit into portraying it that way. And then also um, members of my team talked about 
strength spotting the caregivers themselves and with what they've been doing to build that rapport and help work with them. And so that was a big part of our discussion. And then we also talked about how we would use the film um, and show it to maybe new families who are maybe unsure about START or not quite sure how it works. Cause it is a little bit, um, you know, the collaborative team effort. I think some families look at like, well, what's your role? What exactly, you know? And it's like, well, we kind of do all of these things. And we thought that film really captures the essence of START and the positivity and all of that in it. And showing maybe the film to also new staff members, which are, you know, me and my team. And I think again, just it captures the essence of START. Yes, I think you're so right, Amanda, because um, as new START team members, right? It, it, it's this idea of what you're doing feels like very fuzzy, but to see actual examples, I think could be really, really helpful. So I think you're right, and families as well, of course. So they have a better idea of what they're getting into, right? Because <laughs> that's how it feels sometimes, um, uncertain. So yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. How about group, um, I'm just 10. Okay, um, let me turn on my video. Okay. Um, I don't know that the section of <coughs> to use it or how we've used it um, has been discussed, but what our group talked about was using it during crisis, during um, normal time, just to, to you know build up um, a person's self-esteem, using it with the team, um, all of the the entire support system um, to reframe what the staff is using to describe our individuals, um, kind of as a reminder that that the individual is more than the disability. Uh -huh. um, we talked about the impact um, that it would have. Um, we discussed how it could help our individuals to feel happy, to build self-esteem, to build uh, resilience, um, uh, to rewire their brains and those of the individuals that work with them. Mm -hmm. um, and then one more thing real quick, that it could be used with, thank you, Hannah, that it could be used with funders <laughs> so, that, um, so that they can see what we do. Yes, that's really, I think that's a really good point because a lot of times they're just not sure what they're getting and they ask for different things because they're not sure what to ask for mm -hmm. um, as far as reports and information and that sort of thing. But yeah, I think, I think that's a really great idea too. Yeah. And, and I'll just one more thing. I'm sorry. I can go yeah. on. Um, but to add to the, the, using it for new start members, also using it um, with just new staff at like with the providers as well so that they can understand. Yes, yeah. Hopefully, maybe it would sell it, sell it a little bit, right? <laughs> like, right, absolutely. Okay, maybe I'll pay attention. This doesn't look so bad, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. thank you. All right, thank you, Debbie. Um, I guess we have time for one more group to report out. How about one? Group one. Let me find my camera. Okay. Hi. Hi. So we kind of talked about how we were all still kind of new to start and how some of us had watched these videos prior to our interviews, which was really interesting, um, which kind of gave us a new terminology, a vocabulary that um, we might have used strength spotting in different settings in mental health, but never used that term. So we kind of talked about how we use it a lot with clients, um, both in this model and outside of this model, um, really to instill hope and provide a positive environment. And what we really liked about the videos was the team approach as well. They all worked as a team to provide this positive, supportive environment, which inevitably gave hope. And for Braxton, it was this candle making business 
that, you know, he was just so proud of. So we really found that we use it more often than we think we do and in more settings. Yes. And it could be used with anybody, essentially. Absolutely. You know, I think, Lauren, when, like, I'm a more pleasant person because I am immersed in this and I do it every day. I get less angry about stuff. You know, I think it, yeah. if you actually look for um, the strengths in everybody, right, and understand people from that perspective, it's a lot harder to be aggravated or frustrated. It just gives yeah. you more empathy. And, and when you have that empathy and lack of frustration, that opens you up to thinking of solutions and how to move forward, right? Instead of just right. feeling like there's nothing else I can do, forget it, you know? Yeah. And even what we consider to be typical developing kids, teens, adults, we can use it. Um, mm -hmm. And if we use that empathy and that positive way, we can find solutions for anybody. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. Thanks, Lauren. That's really good. Yeah. I see in the chat, uh, Mickey Tonus. Hi, Mickey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Long time no see you in real life. Um, Mickey said the video showed how the philosophy and theory can be turned into action. Yeah. Thanks for saying that. Cause that is kind of what we're trying to do is we talk, it's, it's all philosophical. It's hard to describe. Well, as a behaviorist, I got to look at the action. <laughs> so. Yep. Yeah, exactly. That's right. So thank you. Thanks for that. All right. Well, I will call on the other groups when we go through other segments of the film. Um, I'm going to share a couple of slides again. Sorry, I don't know how to like just leave it up at this. So I have to do it every time. So um, so we, we, what we did was we asked some of the people who were in the film, like how it impacted them to be part of it. Um, and Shelly was the person who answered for this group. And she said, what I love about the start model and the filming process is that it afforded me the ability to organically carry out my beliefs and philosophies. So similar to what Mickey said, this is like philosophical stuff, right? So how do I turn it into action uh, um, in everyday behavior? Um, and she feels fortunate to do this in her everyday work life. So as you all I'm sure have noticed, Shelly is a, just a lovely human. She's pretty fabulous. So moving on to the next, uh, film segment. There's going to be a lot of focus on this one, or we're going to ask you to focus on PERMA. And if you think back to the orientation, I guess was August, the first one that we did, if I have my month straight, um, we talked a lot about uh, basic positive psychology strategies, including strength spotting, right? But also PERMA. And really, I should have PERMA plus up here, which um, is PERMA or PERMA V is what we call it. And I'll explain that in a second. So if you remember, there's a lot of research done in positive psychology around what are the sort of ingredients or things that we need in our lives in order to experience happiness um, and joy and less, even just less, not just less crisis and less bad stuff, but actual, you know, happiness. Um, so positive emotions are one thing we need to experience engagement. So what are you doing? Um, who are, who are you engaging with positive relationships? How meaningful are those relationships and have you, can you keep them in a, and have them established over the long term? meaning? Are you doing something that is meaningful to you in your day and accomplishments? So being able to achieve things in our everyday life, which often includes things like giving back to others. The V that is not up here is the vitality piece. And that includes kind of that health piece, right? Movement and exercise and healthy nutrition diet. Um, you'll see in this next segment, a focus on all of these. So our resource centers, which I mentioned before in which you saw Braxton was leaving when his dad was coming to pick him up in uh, North Carolina. We're gonna see the resource center that is in Tarrant County, Texas. And um, you'll see that 
it's sort of like a living, breathing perma machine um, that this is embedded in how um, everybody who works there um, and visits there does every day. And we call people who come to our resource center guests because they're not moving in. This is not gonna be turned into um, a residential center. And it also doesn't have the same freedoms that um, you know a residence does. So what we do at our resource centers, for instance, um, there are scheduled activities. We do not have screens here. Um, you can have time to call family members, but you're not gonna be playing a video game on your phone all day. Um, we have, uh, most food is not accessible except for healthy snacks that people can access all day long. Um, our meals are scheduled. Everybody participates in making meals, um, very health conscious. So it's not like a, being home. It's just not at home. It's like you're a guest. Um, so um, this segment is talking about Logan finding his purpose. So I want you to think about when you watch this one, think about what you learned the last two days around trauma and trauma-informed care, um, because you will hear that Logan has experienced a lot of trauma in his life. And you'll also see how his repeated stays at this resource center have impacted him and, and really changed him, really changed him, um, who he is and how he presents himself to the world. Um, I will mention that he, he is somebody who would come regularly for planned visits to the resource center. So some people do that. They come on a planned regular schedule for ongoing assessment and intervention. They usually stay three days. That's about it, a little, a long weekend. Um, so while you're watching, um, I want you to also look at strategies and tools that the resource center staff use that promote PERMA. What are they doing? Um, what is that? I told you it's a living, breathing PERMA environment. Kind of see where you can, where that occurs. Where do you see that? And how do those strategies help promote resilience and stability in Logan, despite his traumatic past? And with that, we're going to watch this next segment. CenterForStartServices.org. Copyright 2020, Center for Start Services. In this segment, you will see how START Resource Centers provide crisis prevention and intervention services and help people to achieve PERMA. Logan, finding his purpose. A young man approaches the front door of a brick house. START Resource Center, Fort Worth, Texas. He pauses at the door, looking back. He scratches his head. Inside, a gray-haired man plays guitar and sings. A homemade poster titled Let It Snow Strengths has snowflakes with printed words on them, including perseverance, honesty, and hope. David Gunter, Resource Center Director. The first young man enters. How are you today? I don't know. Morning meeting. So we're going to get started, and what we're going to do is introduce ourselves. Uh, your name? Sean. Sean. Welcome, Sean. Sean McNeese, Resource Center you guest. Yeah. You want me to help you and tell them? Okay, you're going to do it? Can someone help her out that knows her name? What's your name? Jacoby. Thank Jacoby you. Jacoby Johnson, Resource Center guest. Or, um, Logan. Good morning, Logan. Logan Roberts, Resource Center guest. Self-awareness is the word of the day. For Lisa Dixon, counselor. We're going to be aware of our surroundings and our moods and how we feel and each other. And everyone is going to explain what this means to them 
on self-awareness, okay? Logan. 10 things that make me mad is, well, if I destroy my stuff, which I don't do anymore, but. Great job. And, Logan's um, mother, Leela. We knew something was different about him shortly after he was born. Getting into arguments. He was scared of loud noises, mm -hmm. scared of booming voices. And um, he would go into rages. He was just, just mad. His father, Ron. He was having a fit at one point, and he took his crib and just destroyed the whole crib at three years old from the inside out. I've always seen myself as a monster. What I used to do is throw chairs and throw tables, hit people. I was just an aggressive kid. For Lisa. Can anyone tell me how does breathing help you? Deep breaths, get your blood flowing, yeah. get you started for your morning. Yeah. Uh, Logan, you want to start? Okay, let's go. Leela. The night that he walked into my room in the middle of the night with a butcher knife when he was three is when I said, okay, we can't do this anymore. The doctor put him into a, a mental facility when he was four years old. And he was there for... 21 days. 21 days. One. Yeah. Two. And that's when we got three. our first diagnosis. Four. The group exercises. Uh, I was diagnosed with uh, bipolar, bipolar depression, anxiety, um, Asperger's. Woohoo! shake it off. Like I felt like I wasn't even in control of my body or my emotions. I was just along for the ride of my body. So you talked about what makes you mad, what makes you happy? Cowboy boots. Cowboy boots? Yeah. Woohoo! Sean, what makes you happy? Yeah, <laughs> Been here makes you happy. When I walked into the resource center, I was scared, paranoid, and just nervous. Yeah. What else makes you happy? You see that? Out by a garden. That's cabbage. For Lisa. Cabbage is full of uh, antioxidants and vitamin K. Logan. Yeah, I've been here for the uh, zucchini and the tomatoes. Yeah. David. It's kind of fun to be able to grow something in here. Eat it. Come and get, yeah, come and get it yourself and know where it came from. The Resource Center, it is a behavioral health unit for folks with intellectual disabilities and autism spectrum disorder. Invariably, everybody has a mental health component that they're dealing with also. Let's do all the same. So Logan comes every month, usually for 72 hours. What we've worked with him on is how can he deal with these emotions in a more positive way without breaking all of his own things or putting holes in the wall or scaring people. Because he's a big guy. But folks who know him, he's just a really sweet guy. Logan holds a small plant. We help explore what his strengths are. And his primary strength is kindness. Thanks, Logan. That looks great. So how can we utilize that to help him to stay on track? Laura Golden, occupational therapist. I come in and provide support to the Resource Center counselors on modifying and adapting our therapeutic activities to meet the cognitive, communication, and sensory needs of our guests. Inside, a schedule is on a wall. When the environment is controlled, there's less stimulation going on, and there's a lot of structure. The group sits around a table with food and juice so that I can take this information back to their day environment and provide recommendations to best support them. Jacoby smiles. We can dim the lights. The walls are all pretty neutral, calming colors. We have a sensory room where someone can go when they're overstimulated and just relax. They stand around another garden in the backyard. A plant is marked chocolate mint. Sure. There's also the sensory garden. So they can go out there when they need to calm down or to feel more regulated. What does it smell like, Jacoby? Ooh. <laughs> they can pet the lamb's ear, they can pull off a leaf and take it with them, carry it in their pocket. And then there's more that help just stimulate their smell or olfactory senses. Jacoby holds the mint up to Sean. Oh, that was nice of you to let him smell. Coco. Let, let Logan smell She it. holds leaves out to Logan, who steps in to smell. <laughs> wow. wow. Smells good, huh? Yeah. Laura. <laughs> Hearing the birds, feeling the wind, feeling the 
warmth of the sun and the air around is really calming. All right, Sean, are you ready? Yeah. Check the halls. Mm -hmm. Can you say fa la 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 la? Da, 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 da. Can you say fa la 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 la? Yeah. All right, I'm going to want to Katie hear Lyon, it. music therapist, okay. plays and sings. Check the halls with Sticks and Sean shakes jingle bells. Later around the table. We're gonna just talk about some positive things that that have happened. What about you, Mr. Logan? Is it your girlfriend? He nods. Mm -hmm. Does she make you smile? He nods again. Yeah. <laughs> what is your favorite thing about her? Her hair. Yep. It's red and brown. Okay. Red and brown. Those are some good colors. They're just nice to me. Logan alone. More nice than I could ever imagine. That's all I can ask for. Someone that cares, that treats me the right way, the way I want to be treated, and I treat them the way they, they want to be treated. It's just out of respect. Part of what has to happen, and I think Start does this better than uh, just about anybody, is that the staff work on building relationships. Dan Tomasulo. We try to create an environment where it's okay just to talk about things. Mm, you want to talk about family? It's got to be safe enough. It has to be welcoming enough. How many sisters do you have? Jacoby. Two. Two sisters? And you love your sisters, right? Yeah. You have nieces and nephews? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what their names are? Can you remember? You love them though, right? She nods. They make you smile. David. Are you going to get to see him for the holidays? She nods. Are you looking forward to that? Yeah. I'm good. Kendra Bowens, counselor. So like I can say, I love Sean's glasses. They are really nice. Mm -hmm. That's something positive. Sean looks around smiling. Do you like your glasses, Sean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We both have glasses. He pushes his up. Oh, and Logan. So all three. Laura shows him photos. So for Logan, oh boy. he's been really helpful today. Yeah. What do you think about Sean? And then once people feel OK with each other, then they're more willing to talk about something emotional. Is he kind to you? You like it when he greets you? Jacoby nods. OK. He makes you feel welcome? Yeah. Okay, do you want to say that? They've taken positive psychology and put it right into the core of their trainings for staff and for all the people they serve. Particularly applied positive psychology is how do we, how do we take all these ideas about feeling good and feeling good in a sustainable way and apply them directly? One of the ways that positive psychology frames itself is that you have measures of well-being. Oh, Logan shoots a basketball. Right. There's an acronym, PERMA, P-E-R-M-A, that's been used to identify the five pillars of positive psychology. Kendra shoots and misses. Start has taken those principles and just put them right into all the work that they're doing. So P stands for positive emotion. E stands for engagement. R, relationships. M for meaning. And A for achievement. Logan dribbles and Kendra guards him. If I took a drug to feel good and I didn't have relationship and all the meaning in my life, it, it, it's not well-being. But if I learn how to have gratitude and kindness and compassion in my life, and I know how to focus my attention, and I develop good relationships with people, and uh, I have a sense of purpose in my life, and I know how to set goals and achieve them, now I've got a life that is really full. Logan gets another basket. Hannah Bednar, clinical director. The Resource Center is PERMA embodied. And we have um, activities daily that make sure that that happens for our people while they're here. In the kitchen. You want to go in here and get you one cup. Hannah. So it's especially important because the system we work within is incredibly deficit based. All day long, you hear about what things people can't do. Logan measures peanut butter for dog biscuits. 
And it's just so important to counteract that. Okay, you gonna pour it in there? Jacoby, pour it in there. And then we'll start making our uh, the shapes of our dog bones. For okay. Lisa. Oh, now, do you mind putting the top on this for us? Jacoby takes Thank the peanut you. butter jar. Uh -huh. Can you put that in the sink? You as a professional at this. David. We want to give folks that we serve an opportunity to give back to the community. Push it. Push. A lot of the homeless have dogs. I thought, well, I bet they would like dog biscuits and that, that would be perfect for us to go out and, and be able to actually hand that to a person and get that feedback. With cookie cutters, they form dog bones. Kendra carries a baking sheet of them to a counter by an oven. His glasses off, okay. Logan wipes his brow. <laughs> you said it was only three in here? Yeah, earlier when I looked. Mm -hmm. He puts them yeah. back on. Okay. Later, he stands alone outside on a back patio. He inhales from a vape pen, then exhales smoke through his nose. That's all I can think about is my girlfriend. She's always stuck in my head. Looking down, he shakes his head a little. Hopefully I can meet her dad and go over to her house and, you know, introduce myself. He looks up. I'm just worried that her dad's not gonna like me. When I meet strangers, I get really nervous and my body tightens up. And I just stay quiet. It's hard. He inhales from the vape pen, which has a small Batman logo on it, then lets the smoke stream from his nose. How long have you guys been together? I would say about a month and a couple of weeks. I would want to first get married to her, have a house kind of like this, made of bricks in case the tornado comes. and hopefully have at least one or two kids. I get really scared that something's gonna happen. I might screw something up. I might say the wrong thing on accident. I just worry for the worst. He looks down again. Anne LaForce, Director of Therapeutic Coaching. Crisis can look like anything from a true psychiatric crisis, uh, that somebody needs hospitalization, a change of medication for stability, safety. Logan's given two small cups. But it can also be a crisis because those vulnerabilities related to their diagnosis, their health, sort of biopsychosocial, aren't being addressed as well as they could be. So we see a lot of emotional dysregulation. He takes pills and water. And people see it as behavior without understanding where that behavior is coming from. And that's really what I see Start's role is, is to put that, that behavior into context for people. Logan alone. There was this one hospital I went to that I am not allowed to ever go back there, not because of me, because of what the people did to me. They physically, emotionally and verbally abuse me. And they also sexually abuse me. Mm -hmm. Dan Tomasulo. We have people who have been traumatized maybe more than any other group on, on the planet. But if you start looking at things as, all right, this is a transformational time. This is a time where a person's um, uh, sense of the world can shift. And what would be the most helpful way to get them to think about meaning in their life? Yes, this difficulty happened, but how do you recover from that? I'm gonna wear the Joker ring as mad as silver. And Angela's gonna wear the Harley Quinn ring. And almost always, if you do a thoughtful investigation of the person's life and help them think about it, they'll find out that they've gotten knocked down and back up many, many times in their life. And you can tell because you're always smiling. 
So that's a good thing. It's something that makes you feel good. Later, Kendra. So, so we're going to be writing or pictures or we can draw um, positive things towards each other. So, Laura. So is Kendra kind or fun to do activities with? Logan writes on the fingers of a hand mm. outline. Fun to do activities with? All right. Jacoby cries. <sighs> you want to wait for a little bit? <sighs> she covers her face. Laura. Jacoby, can we help make you feel better by talking about all the awesome things? Can we talk, can we talk about all the good things that everybody <laughs> said about you? Yes. Look at this one. She looks. That one that you said a while ago? Nice smile. Does everybody tell you you have a nice smile? They're a nice everybody smile. Everybody likes your smile, don't they? She smiles. Look oh, at it. What's that one? Pretty. She wipes tears. Even though it looked kind of disruptive to the therapeutic activity at the time. Did you know you were pretty? She nods. Yeah, of course you know you're pretty. <laughs> she smiles wide. You're a great friend. It gave us an opportunity to help Jacoby work on being more self-aware. Funny and a great dancer. And really use that as more of a, a teaching and learning uh, situation instead of a disruption because it, it's fine. Sean holds Logan's hand and cries. <laughs> so Joanna and Kendra are back there helping her make her feel better. Uh -huh. To make you sad to see other people sad. Mm -hmm. Me too. Kendra and Jacoby come back. She's coming back. Did she look better? Yeah. He got upset because you were upset. Can we finish reading what everyone likes about you? Always happy. So we need to cheer back up so we're always happy. <laughs> <laughs> you have good energy. Laura reads from another handout line. You make someone feel welcome. Yeah, I mm -hmm. You're fun to be around. Mm. And then we just added caring. Sometimes we don't always feel really good, but you can keep this with you. And whenever you don't feel so good, you can look at it and think, oh man, a lot of people think really nice things about me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. He turns to Jacoby. You want to hear what Logan's good things were? Says really helpful or nice guy, very sweet, has great manners. <clears throat> thoughtful. Very thoughtful. That's oh, helpful. helpful. Yeah. So you got a double dose of helpful. Mm -hmm. That's pretty helpful. Super awesome and helpful mm -hmm. today. Logan nods with Laura. Do you think of yourself that way sometimes? He shakes his head. How did it make you feel saying nice things about other people? I feel good. Yeah around family or around friends and stuff and maybe things aren't going so well, what are some things that you can do? Just trying to make them feel better. Trying to make them feel better? Oh, that's good, yeah. How, like, like, what are some of the things that you do to make people feel better? Tell my mom that she looks pretty and she, she should be told that every day. Yeah? Oh, I bet she hates that, right? <laughs> that's great. Later, Logan and David leave the house, and Logan steps to a van, where Sean sits inside. Logan gets in, and the van heads out through an open gate. They go to the Fort Worth stockyards. They used to run all the cattle up here. He and Logan walk together. Uh, but this was where the good not loving trail started. Ranch workers on horseback escort some cattle through the tourist area. Leela. He wants to work with horses, and he wants to own a ranch. Verlisa points something out to Sean. He can ride one, he knows how to feed them and clean them, but it's the, the maturity in order to own a ranch. I think he's got it. Eventually he will get it. A little boy in a group waves his jacket like a red cape. Logan smiles. My biggest dream for him, and I know that he, has, he speaks to me about it a lot, is having a family. The start group walks on a wooden ramp. I've always wanted him to be able to get a career or go to college. For Lisa and Jacoby walk at the back. And I really hope for him that as he gets older and matures and learns how to cope with his, his feelings better that he is able to settle down and maybe possibly have a child.
Hannah. In terms of morale for a family who really is in this deficit-based system and just hears all the time, your son's never gonna be able to do X, Y, or Z. Logan walks behind Sean and Laura with a stick in his mouth. To have someone who comes in and says, yes, he can, and we're gonna help you is huge. And I think that's one of the biggest things that I love about START is just seeing relief watch, wash over people's faces when they hear, you know, yes, he can and we're gonna help. They sit in front of a Texas flag for a photo. His father, Ron. The Resource Center at the STAR program has been wonderful for him. And just the, the last six months, he's a different person. A completely different person. Yeah. He walks on with the group. Lila. It's actually like, you know, like I, I have a son that I can talk to, have a conversation with. And I've never had that before. Titles, directed and produced by Dan Habib, Exec All right, so that was segment two, and I can see that I calculated time a little off. Um, so we're done a little early with that one. Maybe we want to go into our breakout rooms now before our lunch, mid-afternoon break. Um, when you go to your breakout rooms, um, talk about what you observed and, and think about how do you promote positive engagement for the people you serve or work with? Um, and how have you seen respite centers being used in your community? Um, and maybe similarities and differences and what we might want to focus on if we are working with some of your respite, respite centers, what, what can we do to help out or give new ideas? Um, have you used or observed the effective means of helping others achieve PERMA plus? And again, in what situations might you use this film? Um, Beth and Anne-Marie, are we able to go into our breakout groups? Yes, we are all set to go into our breakout rooms. For those who are in the main room, if you are assigned a room, just do not click join, just click later, and that will keep you again in the main room. Okay, thank you. Here we go. Hello, um, my name is Nellie. I just want you guys to know I'm going to have my video off, but I will keep my mic unmuted as much as I can. I may have a little toddler yelling in the background, so I'll mute her <laughs> whenever that starts happening. Okay, great. Welcome. My name is Ebony. I'm in the hazmat outfit today. Uh, <laughs> hey, Ebony. I'm going to turn, turn my video off because I am... Um, doing a little bit of okay. reconnaissance for my program, <laughs> remote services. All right.
Is there anyone else in the main room? I'm still here. Okay. okay. Hey, Dave. All right, so you just need someone who's going to report back. Who wants to do that this time? I can report back. This is Donna Stevens. Oh, hi, Donna. Great. Thank you. Um, so did, did you all see the questions, the prompts, or would you like me to reread those? Can you please reread them? Sure. Okay. Um, okay. okay. Just, Logan, discuss what you observed. How do you promote positive engage, engagement for all? How have you seen respite centers being used in your community? And how are people supported there? Have you used or observed effective means of helping others achieve PERMA plus? Positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meaning, achievement, and health, well-being in their lives. And in what situations might you use this film and with whom to achieve what? And I'll let you guys take this away. Oh, well, this is Ebony. Um, and I didn't know it was called PERMA at the time. Um, we didn't have a name for it. I work at a special needs day program. I'm the director there. Hi, Ruby. I mean, hi, Anne Marie. So Did I think you... Mickey's, Mickey's yeah. uh, video is disabled. Okay. Yes. Where yeah, are you, but, Mickey? Okay. All right. right here. Let's see what I can do for you. Thank you. So, yeah, guys. So, so the, the just the pr lack of pressure, I think. What did you guys think? I just wanted to, um, let me do my screen. It's not, uh, we, we didn't know we were following the PERMA process, but I know that I want to share this with my team and include more of the PERMA, like at the end, the, um, the achievements and the meaningfulness so that they can um, feel valued in their community as well as just with us. And having the formula helps. Uh, we have utilized the film uh, whenever we have folks, you know, because it's uh, obviously a voluntary program for somebody to come in. So we actually have a uh, virtual tour of the res of the facility itself of Lisa Dixon uh, and uh, Hannah Bednar put that together. And so folks are able to see it uh, because sometimes it's kind of scary to go into a new environment that you don't know anything about, uh, especially if you're gonna be staying there for you know overnights and things like that. But we also uh, sent links to this uh, film for them to be able to see it. Um, you know, so they can feel more comfortable and more informed when they're making a decision on to whether or not they want to come to the resource center, especially with folks that are coming like uh, for emergency visits, like as a step down from a hospital or or something. So, This is Donna, I'm reporting, um, but I'll, I'll, what I really um, enjoyed about seeing the video was how they put them together at the table and let them talk about, um, you know, what they're feeling and how it made them feel if people smiled or, or what they wanted for their life. Um, I think that helped them feel heard. And um, I've seen, I've been in direct care for many, many years. Um, and I've seen people come through our doors that have never been heard before. 
and just listening and uh, like we've had cooking classes when that we figured out they wanted to cook they've never had anyone that would let them in the kitchen before things like that that uh, I think that kind of um, redirection from um, the everyday life of, of the stress of knowing that you have special needs but you know you can do more I think that means a whole lot not uh, I didn't I've never saw um, a program quite like this but I've seen some kind of like that where they could garden and I've seen people go from level six where they were wanting to tear everything up to going out and planting potatoes and uh and they became a different person and I appreciate this this is really good uh, eye opener here this is Jill I'm really not in the group but anyway <laughs> What I, you know, having talked yesterday and well, two days before about trauma, what I really appreciated about uh, about this this part of the film is um, it shows how the positive strength based approach is a trauma treatment. I mean, that's what happened um, here is that refocusing on somebody's strength. We're not ignoring the trauma, but we're, as Dan Thomasula was saying, it's a opportunity to kind of people sometimes have post-traumatic growth and i think that's what happens with with when we insert strengths and um a positive um perspective into some of the ways that we interact with people so i appreciate that connection between somebody who has had a lot of trauma um but their strengths are building resilience for the future for them Uh, this is Raylene from California. I um, I enjoyed the uh, the film in itself. There were so many things that stood out for me. What I liked is the the way the the counselor, because we I work with uh, respite care providers, and I think showing them or really talking to them about PERMA is going to be extremely helpful in terms of how they build their relationships with their clients. Um, I think coming in, having some skills about how to engage our clients and, you know, engage our clients in terms of always zooming in on the positive. I like the way the um, counselor seems to always be on the spot with something positive to say about everyone. And I thought that was, she just seems to be ready. She seems to be ready. She pulls something out and uh, the, the, the child may say something, the individual may say something and she's like, that's wonderful. I'm glad that um, you noticed that, you know, Jacoby missed you. I mean, or, you know, missed you while you were away or, She's back now. Doesn't it make you happy that she's back? Um, I like that um, the the staff understood clearly that building a relationship, it doesn't happen overnight, but building a relationship starts to open up the door where people are more comfortable with exposing their deep emotional sides of themselves that can help them to move their their um their goals forward and so that's i mean I'm, I'm i'm seeing a lot of the skills that are just really amazing to me i would just like to interject too it's it's a hell of a lot of fun uh working with our guests i mean we get a lot out of it uh at least as much as they do, probably even more. Well, for example, the the, the hand the hand activity, when um, when I think her name is Jacoby, when the guest was, uh, you, you know, was going through was crying, and you turned to her and you said, "Well, wow, you know what? You can use this the next time, you know, you're feeling this way." we have something that you can you can go back and take a look at to remind you how special 
people think you are. And I'm, I'm thinking that's, that works for everybody. Not, you know, that will work for anyone. So I thought that was, and it also worked for the guest that was sitting next to her. I can't think of his name, but he too was guided in a similar direction. You know, see how special you are? Let's talk about all the wonderful things people think about you, you know, and, and then his smile went from one way and then he just, he just lit up. And so it, 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 it's fun, but it's still an art. It's an art that needs to be, I think, uh, that needs to be learned and respected because everybody can't do this. You know, working with our uh, respite providers, sometimes I hear, well, I don't really know what to say. I'm meeting them for the first time. Well, these are skills that you can use with anyone that you're meeting for the first time. You come in with a, with a pocket full of wonderful tools that you can bring out and use anytime. So I think this, this is great, great, great stuff. All right, everybody. Sounds like there was some great discussions happening. Thank you all for participating and engaging. The time is now 3 o'clock Eastern, 12 o'clock Pacific. We're going to move into our half an hour break. Please feel free to stay in the Zoom meeting. You can mute yourself and turn your cameras off. Get up, move around, get something to eat, and we'll see you back here in 30 minutes, a half an hour. See you back here at 3.30 Eastern, uh, 12.30 Pacific, and we will do some large group debrief after our breakout sessions. Thanks all.
All right, it's 3.30 Eastern, 12.30 Pacific. Welcome back, everybody. We're going to get started in just a minute. Okay, welcome back. Hope you guys had a nice little afternoon break or noon break, uh, depending on where you are. Um, so we left right after you guys had your breakout discussion. So just for a few minutes, I'd like to hear some input from some of the groups anyway. Um, so how about somebody from group four? Do we have a representative from group four? Hi. Hi, I'm happy to, uh, let me scroll to that area here. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, is there a certain part that you'd like us to review or to Whatever talk? part you wanna talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever you'd like to report on is fine with me. So we were making comments in terms of the positive engagement for all uh, in watching the support staff interact with everybody, both staff and guests. We saw a lot of consistency. Uh, we saw a lot of equity and that's trust building when you see that. Uh, we saw a lot of value in having an environment that allows room for, learn for learning opportunities to crop up rather than simply are we on track uh, speaking specifically to the program activity where one of the guests had a, a moment of crying and being upset and the staff explaining uh, you know, that that's not an interruption. We don't look at that as an interruption. It's a natural opportunity to reinforce the concepts and, and really for inclusivity too. So both it hammers homes, the components that the guests are learning about during their stay, um, as well as showing inclusiveness in that healing or in that uh, evolution. Uh, we also appreciated when staff were speaking about the increasing the opportunities and transitioning people to unpaid supports and how vital unpaid supports are for people with developmental and other disabilities and for everybody to have people in your life and networks that don't waver, that aren't dependent on funding or on a, you know program eligibility, just the importance of that. And then we were commenting in our group also a little bit further down in terms of how we see resource or respite centers used in our community. We had two states represented in our, in our breakout group, both Connecticut and California. We both noted that it would be wonderful to see models like this in every state, but specifically where there is shared accountability between the developmental disability services system and the mental health behavioral health care system within a given state, because we see far too often the um, separate and unequal right service provision and development for people with IDD instead of having some sense of uh, shared accountability to develop these systems and supports, not just from disability services, but also from behavioral health and mental health care systems within states. So we talked about how as we as we see start expand, we'd really love to see states take that on with a shared accountability model rather than having it be exclusively housed in developmental disability services within, within a state. Right, right. And, and, you know, that's interesting, because there are some states who've done it as a collaboration or with a mental health center, it may sometimes it's not always the state, um, a DMH, Department of Mental Health, but sometimes we have had mental health providers reach out to us to do this. Um, even though it's much more frequently, you know, the IDD providers or, or the departments and states on the ID side, but you're right. And that's exactly why START exists, right? Is because there's this gap between services for people with IDD and mental health services. And it's kind of, oftentimes there's, there's people who fall between the cracks of both where both systems are saying, not mine, hot potato, right? <laughs> like if this person has recognized 
mental health conditions, a lot of IDD providers are um, uncomfortable. And it, it's not, I don't think out of any kind of, um, it's not purposefully negative. <laughs> I think it's because people don't know what to do, right? People in these systems don't know that they have the capacity to do it. So that's a big part of why we exist is to help build that capacity in the community so that services are available, same services can be available to everyone. I mean, we're not gonna turn every mental health provider in every community um, into being comfortable serving somebody with IDD, but it is definitely our goal to get more, right? And to continue to spread that. So I just find that really interesting that that came up through this. Thank you, thank you. All right, how about somebody from group let me find a number I haven't picked, nine. Do we have a representative? Group nine, going once, going twice. <laughs> All right. Maybe not. How about group eight? Hi. Hi. So um, in our group, um, we thought a lot about, um, there was a theme of uh, relational style in um, what we observed. And this ranged all the way from just how people responded in the moment. Um, you could really see that there was a lot of active listening at the center. Um, conveying care, uh, especially um, considering that people may not have experienced a lot of that in their life or may have had those kinds of traumatic experiences that have damaged trust. Um, and also that it's very community oriented, which is not always common in um, some of our other mental health or other um, human service settings. Um, uh, Echoing what the other group said, um, there is a hope that we'll see um, more of this model uh, kind of spread into other places. Um, there were some people in the group who, you know, hadn't experienced this. I think most of us hadn't um, actually seen it in person. Um, but for people who did, the things that stuck out the most were um, just the sense of it being very low pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, very calming. Mm -hmm. um, and there was an emphasis on um, the importance of visual uh, visualization, visual tools um, to be to, to engage people um, and relax people. Um, we also noticed how it supported systems to support the person in a very per, a very humanistic person centered way. Um, so, for example, we noticed that uh, Logan's parents were supportive of his life goals on his own terms. They weren't uh, projecting or demanding anything of him. They, you know, heard from him what he wanted, um, and he was supported in that. Um, and so for uh, potential fu future uses with the ways people would like to um, you know, a couple ways that people would like to bring this into their lives and work. Um, uh, we heard that it might be really beneficial for um, staff uh, in programs to see this, you know, for, for multiple, really throughout an organization for everyone to be um, aware of some of these uh, strategies. And then also the possibility of um, it interacting with residential programs or being included in residential programs. Um, that was another really interesting idea. I think I covered most of, most of okay. it. Okay. Okay. Well, that's great. Um, you know, and that's, I find it interesting that you guys caught on to the visual, the use of visuals is everywhere. I mean, that means people were looking beyond the humans on the screen to see all the visual things up and the tools that we're using uh, hands-on. So that's pretty cool that that was noticed. But yeah, that is a very well integrated part of what's done at our resource centers. Um, I also like that you guys were 
focusing on the humanity of it because that is right that's how we help people through their challenges and go beyond them um and i just felt like logan was such a good um example of that because it really was six months before this filming that he was referred to the start program and was doing all the things he was talking about breaking things he could not at that time um describe feeling angry or frustrated um he mm -hmm. would he would just behave in certain ways he would explode um so it was just interesting that you know I really liked the the story, but that he could articulate that too, that, you know, he's- And that he was integrated in his group as a community member where he could cultivate his own, you know, po positive identity yeah. and meaning. He wasn't just someone who was there receiving treatment, but he was described as helpful. Um, he was interacting with the other guests um, and really also taking kind of a, a leadership role or a friendship role. And, you know, what, what, what wasn't shown because there was so much that we filmed and you, we only have so many minutes that somebody wants to watch a film, right? Um, <laughs> it's not um, reality TV, but, um, you know, he really does take on more of a leadership role when he is there. He sometimes on some of the group activities that he knows well, he can lead them. At times, so it's pretty neat that, um, yeah, he gets to even, you know, tap into that helpfulness even more. So, that's yeah. awesome. Thank and your your bookshelf is amazing. I have. One oh, one. thanks. <laughs> and I was like, is that a fake background? I just. Have to <laughs> nope. All real. Thank you. Nice job. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Um, how about group uh, six? Hello, this is group six. I'm going to stay off video. I have to wear my mask, so you can't really see what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, we had a lot of interesting uh, things being brought up in our group. Uh, one of the things that we touched base on is the resource centers not being in all of the states. Um, and then when they are, um, for instance, in Tennessee, sometimes it's uh, hard to access these places, the resource centers, because they're so far away or they're full capacity. Um, even with the mobile crisis, um, getting that come to the homes or in, to the place where needed is difficult. So there's a lot of challenges um, with um, individuals accessing these resources. Um, so, um, and then some states don't have it at all. So the ones that do, um, some, you know, they get really full and the ones that uh, states that don't have it, well, we work with what we got. So we were talking about some of the things that we are doing to help others achieve PERMA in their lives. Mm -hmm. And with that, um, one of us was talking about, you know, sometimes we're doing it without even realizing it because um, we're doing it sometimes even with our loved ones. So uh, one of uh, someone in our team has a loved one with autism. So, you know, they cheer her on. She loves to dance. So if her song comes on at a store and she begins to dance, they're cheering for her. So they're promoting PERMA mm -hmm. um, in that aspect. So it was a very uh, good example of how to adapt it with individuals. Yeah, oh, that's a neat example. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and you're right, not every state has um, the capacity to have a resource center um, or behavioral respite in some states, like you said, in Tennessee. Michelle Bagby uh, noted that they're, they're improving, working on that issue, right, about availability. Um, and I know they're spread out. That that happens in a lot of states, to be honest. Um, so it, it's because of different funding structures. Some states have this and some don't, depending on how how well they can be funded. And, um, and the priority it takes for the state, you know, to make it happen. But yeah, I know every time somebody sees 
a resource center sees a film about it, they want one. Um, and every time I go, I want to stay <laughs> so I can understand that. <laughs> lovely environments. But thank you. Thank you for reporting out. You're welcome. All right, guys. So back to slides. Um, all right. Oops, excuse me, went too fast. So the people, again, uh, just a little insight um, into the people who participated, how did it impact them? Um, Logan said it was, it was exciting because he wants people to know they're not alone in the world. Um, he said he was anxious at first with having the camera on him, but after a while he felt comfortable enough that he could open up and he got deep talking with Dan. So as, as that we were all kind of surprised when he started talking about um, past trauma because he hadn't talked about that to, I don't think Dave can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think he had talked much about that um, before. Um, so he did get more, more comfortable. And again, he- Yeah, he hadn't talked about that much before. Yeah, yeah. He and loved the camera. <laughs> he did, and it loved him, I have to yeah. say. He, he was great. Um, but also, you know, I, again, this shows his caring about other people, right? As he wants other people to know they're not alone. And, and he's just such a kind, wonderful young man. Um, let's see, there we go. Um, so Kendra, she was one of the resource center counselors you saw, um, for being part of this, it helped her learn to focus more on what the guests are communicating to her during the activities, both verbally and through body language. I think that having that camera there made her see um, the physicality part too, you know, what people are doing um, in the room. And it kind of gets you to shift your focus a little bit outside of what you're immediately doing sometimes. And one thing that we do have resource center counselors do very regularly is videotape themselves and then go back with the group um, of counselors and their supervisors and their clinical directors and review those so that they're constantly learning about what they're doing well and what they could do better next time they um, use a particular activity or how they're engaging. Um, Verlisa, who is another resource center counselor, she said, it helped me see the changes we've been able to help make in people's lives. Um, for example, Logan is much more in touch with his feelings and can express them now. In the past, he would become aggressive and break things. He doesn't do that now. He's learned how to deal with feelings of frustration. Um, and I think that that's, I think what Verlisa is pointing out is really important. And I think it's similar to what I said at the beginning about what was fun to me for making this film is you get to stop and reflect on the progress you made. Because when you are part of a start team, you are, you're working in crisis response and crisis prevention. So you don't always take a moment to sit up and reflect and, and really look at sort of the bigger picture of, of the impacts that you're making. So um, it was nice that Verlisa had that opportunity too. And these are um, Logan's parents, if you recall, and Leela Roberts said it was nice to be able to tell our story and our experience when Logan was about Logan growing up. Um, and um, in the past, I, there we go, I had to uncover it. In the past, one little thing could send him into a rage. He's made a complete 180. It was nice to be able to put it out there and let others who are dealing with similar issues know they're not alone. Similar to what Logan said, you can see that uh, as an apple, he didn't fall far from the tree, right? Concerned about helping others. So now we're gonna move on to our third and final chapter, I guess, or segment of the start film. And it's about Rosa um, and shining her light You'll see why it's called that as you watch. Um, some of the things that are really highlighted in this segment is the systemic engagement that occurs. So how the um, START team, both the START coordinator and the coach have really gotten the family involved, how they've engaged them as well as the school. Um, and you don't see it on this film, but I think it's referred to also her mental health um, 
prescribers. So um, it's really interesting. You'll also see the importance of cultural competence. This occurs in New York City, um, this, this segment. And Rosa's mother is bilingual, um, both Spanish and English, but Spanish preferred. So we, there are areas and um, times where you'll see there, there is an interpreter. Um, and we needed, we needed our translation, I'm sorry, someone who translates in the moment, and that's helpful. Um, also, we see um, a good example of diagnostic clarification for Rosa, for this little girl. So before we start the film, just kind of things to think about again, um, is watch to see what strategies does the START team use to engage Rosa and her family and her larger system of support? And how did those strategies also impact Rosa? You know, how did changing maybe some things at school impact her? Um, and watch for the use of reframing and how it impacted not only Rosa, but her school as a whole. All right, I think we're ready for the film. In this segment, you will see how a start coordinator and coach work together to support a girl named Rosa, her family, and her school to help treat her depression and open her world again. Rosa, shining her light. Brooklyn, New York. A little girl skips beside an adult carrying a decorated backpack. Traffic passes an apartment block. In one apartment, another girl plays a computer game. And why you make the school? You want to show me? No. Why? Yes, because I don't want to. I don't want to? Why? Because I don't want to. Okay. Clara Casas, Rosa's mother. And then you show no, you not show me nothing for the school? No. Rosa Nieves, age 10. So I heard school is going pretty well. Um, for now, I think so it's okay for now. Do you like the Hawthorne, uh, Rosa? No. No? Not sure yet? She dunks a cookie in milk. Do you like anything about it? The only thing I like about cookies is that they taste good. <laughs> she eats it. And I like that. I'm a gamer girl. <laughs> What'd you say? I'm a gamer girl. <laughs> she keeps playing while Clara sits on a futon behind her. <laughs> Rosa gets up and goes to her. She sits with her and hugs her. Rosa juts her head toward Clara's face. <laughs> NY Start, Region 4, Richmond Kings. Thanks everybody for coming. Today again, we're going to be looking at real so far clinical case review today. As usual, we're going to put our heads together and brainstorm and see how we can support Deandra. NY Start Region 4 has worked with Rosa and her mother for about a year. At the time she was referred, Rosa rarely left home, except for school. So we just want to put our heads together and see how we can come up with a good plan to support uh, Rosa. With a dozen other people, director Sharon Cyrus Savory. So Deandra, why don't you start by just giving us a little overview and then tell us where we are currently with our work. Okay, well Rosa's a 10-year-old Hispanic female. She has autism spectrum disorder. ADHD, and initially she was diagnosed with intimate explosive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder. She's helpful, she's loving, creative, enjoys drawing. Coordinator Deandra Brent. She's also resilient because Rosa has been through a lot during her short 10 years. Rosa came to New York Star because she was exhibiting physical aggression towards her teacher, toward, uh, towards other peers within her classroom. She was unable to communicate her thoughts and her feelings, and she would talk about suicidal ideation. She would make threats, I'm gonna kill myself, I want to die. Rosa lies in bed with a laptop. Prior to me receiving a case, she was hospitalized in Bellevue. They want to make sure that she wasn't suicidal. She was losing relationships. 
And then these acts of aggression would come into play and then she would have to leave the school. And Rosa's mother did tell me that one time she asked her mother if she was crazy. Why am I not like the other children? Rosa lies on a windowsill playing with a window blind chain. Why do I keep going to the hospital? When she was brought to the emergency room, these diagnoses were placed on her because of what they saw right then and there. It's not that they knew Rosa or who she was, but she was exhibiting um, isolation. She was um, not wanting to go out into the community. So my clinical imp impression was that she was depressed. Sharon. You want to kind of update the team where we are now and, and how coaching is supporting Rosa? Therapeutic coach team lead, Corey Fisk. She had a wonderful receptive, but really struggled with expressing her emotions. So what our coach is implementing is our different strategies that Rosa can express to her mother what's going on with her. NY Start staff meets with Rosa's mother and an interpreter, Deandra. So this, this also comes with autism, where she's nervous, she's not really um, understanding what's gonna happen. Corey. Something's wrong, so Rose identifies that she's upset. You know, what's exactly wrong? Perhaps um, she misses someone, but maybe it's a sensory sensitivity of the space is too noisy. So this is also giving her more language to communicate. Al menos cuando ella nos quiere decir las cosas, te dice cómo se siente con su manita. Yeah, she says it's helped her a lot um, because even when she doesn't want to say, you know, if she asks her, how are you feeling? She doesn't want to say, she'll point ah. to the pamphlet. <laughs> um, That's awesome. Tri-County Care Manager Maria Rodriguez. Rosa attends Hawthorne Country Day School, which is an NY Start partner. Deandra Brent, Rosa's NY Start coordinator, provides outreach and collaboration to school personnel. Students who attend Hawthorne Country Day School are generally here because the schools that are a part of their districts didn't feel they had the level of service that the students needed based on their evaluations. Program manager Kim Aruda. So they attend our school to get more targeted support. Rosa stands with Zylena Greaves. So students can function at a more independent level. Teachers work with other students. We would always want to see how a student who is able go back to their home community school. At the heart of what we do are decisions that are made in the best interest of the child. At the case review, Sharon. We did quite a bit of systemic consultation with the school mm -hmm. in order to better understand what was happening with some of the expression of wanting to harm herself. Thanks for using my name. At the school. Sure. See, when you use my name, I know that you're talking to me, right? We do something yeah. called strength spotting. Yes. When I see somebody do something that shows their persistence, and I know that's a top strength of those, I can capture it. I can identify it. So, man, you really stuck with that. Dan Tomasulo. And with strength spotting comes strength activation. I'm not looking at him and using your words. Rosa plays a board game with a boy. If I acknowledge that or validated that, you, you would be much more likely to demonstrate that. And once people are doing their strengths, it's like you're shining your light uh, in the best possible way. Therapeutic coach Alexa Eugene. Down the road when she's a teenager, when she's 16, you know, it might be really helpful to, for her to understand that she's a team player and for her to understand her appreciation for beauty and excellence um, so she can utilize that and have her own uh, self and her own esteem to kind of help carry her through the challenges that she will face. Deandra. What I wanted to do um, was bring what her mother was teaching her at home, giving her the time and the space at home, bring that to the school. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yes, absolutely. Deandra provides consultation um, to Rosa's teacher, know. Leah Kuriyama. Yeah, I just wanted definitely... to get an update on Rosa, see how she's doing. Oh, yeah. What we do at New York Star is like we strength spot. Because mm -hmm. one of some of her strengths are bravery. Mm -hmm. um, she she's always willing to do like um, different things. She has the courage to do it. She's not afraid mm -hmm. to try it for the first time. Mm -hmm. One thing that's great with her is kind of following her lead and letting her, you know, make her own schedule and give her peers directions because that incorporates her strengths, her leadership mm -hmm. um, into things that mm -hmm. she doesn't typically enjoy so much. And also with um, increments of breaks, 
-hmm. in between when she has breaks which is not she's not just focused on work yeah. and she has breaks in between she does very well yeah she does really well with a timer Tire. she knows exactly what she's doing exactly how long she's doing it we found that to be very successful with her the timer stops when she stops doing her work. Start here, right? The directions start here. So she points out a section on a page to Rosa. What's the first sentence? And she knows that she has to get to 20 minutes or 30 minutes to just kind of relax and take a break. All right, nice job. Rosa stands and high fives her, then plays a video game. If she is working and you start to see her get frustrated, we just give her a vocal prompts like, you know, you can ask for a break. Rosa with another student. Other teachers guide Massimo to look over at Rosa. Sharon. How did the cross systems crisis plan help with informing her new group of supporters or new caregivers in school? NY Start Clinical Case Review Meeting, all start team members. Clinical team leader Deanna Baker. The Cross System Crisis Prevention and Intervention Plan is a document that we create collaborating with all of the systems that uh, are in a person's, that the person works with. So we, we work with the family, we work with the school, psychiatrist, psychologist, therapist, day program, whoever uh, supports the person that we're working with. So this is a document that outlines what to do the, in the event of all these different levels of crisis um, and who to call and how to assist the person in that moment. Some days she has good days, some days she has bad days. Deandra. She would come off the bus. If she was agitated, her day would not go right in school. Thank you. Zylina blocks Rosa from grabbing another student. Rosa jabs her shoulder into Zylina as she continues to walk. So what her teacher did was create an intervention using the Cross Systems Crisis Plan that asked her to express her feelings. Zylina speaks with her. To a point, and it would be happy, sad, okay, or miserable. So from knowing that, they would know what she needed. Sharon. So the good news is that through working with our medical director and consulting with Rosa's psychiatrist, we were able to rule out the intermittent explosive disorder, the impulse control disorder, and it was decided that depression was the, clearly the more indicated um, diagnosis at this time. Yes, yeah. that's accurate. Her medication was changed from Prozac 40 milligrams to 60 milligrams. She was deficient in folic acid. So she was giving folic acid and it began to give her more energy. So with this medication change, she's up and about, she's um, vibrant. It really speaks to the biopsychosocial lens through which we have to look at folks. With Rosa as Eileen. Parachute time. We're gonna have what? I don't know where it was. Calm body. Calm body, what else? No screaming. No screaming. What else? No fighting. No fighting. Corey. When we completed the happiness assessment with Rosa, we learned a lot about how PERMA impacts her life. Clinical Director Jill Hinton. PERMA stands for Positive Emotion, Engagement, Relationships, Meaning, and Accomplishments. And all of those things are things we all want in our lives. Students and teachers wave a multicolored parachute. Positive Emotion engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishments. So that's what we're trying to build into the plans that we, when we work with systems and with individuals. Rosa lies under the parachute. Corey. For example, in the pleasure section, in her answer to a place to go just to enjoy herself and not think about anything, she answered mountains. Standing, Rosa. Corey, what's your favorite cookie? Chocolate chip cookies. They all shake the parachute. She likes to think about being in the mountains, feeling the breeze with her eyes closed. She also talks about how deeply she loves her family. I am very proud of some things I do in the world. This is what I am proud of. She wrote, being nice to her brother. The people that she cares about, my friends, mother and father. So 
In order to be preventative about crisis, you should always um, have access to her family, doing positive activities. And this will prevent crisis even from brewing in the first place. We are all cultural beings. Cultural and linguistic competency mentor, Tawara Good. And as we think about culture, as it relates to Rosa, her family was primarily Spanish speaking, lived in New York City, large city, huge urban setting. What does it mean to live in such a setting, to be able to access services, getting transportation, understanding the meaning of disability to this family? Clara speaks with the NY START team in Russ's house. Creo que nuestra vida. New York START provided interpretation services so that the family could indeed understand and participate. Clara. Siento que somos en la familia. Maria. So she's saying the quality she feels that as a family, it's just their perseverance um, and just working very hard to try to make sure that Rose is okay and that she's happy because their life as a family revolves around Rosa. Mm. How was school? Good. Oh, wonderful. Okay, she's just in the hoy. Deandra. Rosa's anxiety can be overwhelming at times. She doesn't like being around crowds. She doesn't like the noise outside. Rosa always stayed in the house. She wouldn't want to go outside um, to go to the supermarket with her mother, go to the laundry. She didn't want to do any chores. Rosa preparing to go shopping. Thank you. Give me the keys. She was a, afraid of crossing the street that she would get hit by a car. Corey. So um, what the therapeutic coach implemented was a first, then, next. So instead of, all right, we're going to go outside now. Let's go. Get ready. Um, it was like, okay, it's time to get out of bed. Then we're going to go brush our teeth, and then we can put on our shoes. Rosa walks wow. downstairs. One to one. One. Child coordinator Chantel one. Diamond. In terms of having a preventative measure, maybe prepping her before she goes so that she can get used to different noises that do exist in the world. Vamos a la farmacia de aquí, que quizá tú consigas algo ahí. and Clara step outside. Allowing her to see these are the things we can do to ensure that you're fine. So if you hold your mom's hand, that's a safety precaution she can take. And now she has more control over the outside environment as well. They walk holding hands. And the pharmacy right there? Yes, but yeah, but... They cross the street. Vamos ahí, sí? Sí, vamos a la farmacia. Okay. They reach a pharmacy on a corner. Clara opens the door and they go inside, walking down narrow aisles. Smiling, Rosa points up at something on a wall. It's a sassy on TV product. They step to a counter. Okay. Deandra. And the biggest accomplishment that I think Rosa has accomplished is interacting with others. Her mother would ask her to interact with the clerk behind the counter. I give you the hand, please. Give them the money, and then she would say thank you afterwards. Thank you so much. Rosa gets the bag. Okay. So her mother has played a very tremendous role in helping Rosa with socialization skills. They go outside. The family just has so many strengths that we, we build on. She's also resilient because there, there are times when she feels um, overwhelmed. Deandra provides training and outreach at Rosa's house. Okay, so that's my training on autism. Does anyone have any questions? Is it something that you didn't understand? Any concerns? Something you want me to go over? Maria translates for Clara, who answers. Dígale que no tengo preguntas, pero me quedé pensando mucho en lo en lo que me dicen porque es verdad muchas veces no los entendemos porque no sabemos cómo tratarlos. She says she doesn't have any questions, but it has it, it, it left her thinking about you know a lot of things that you know Rosa has done that she didn't understand before. Um, and she wasn't able to understand her, but now she's she's learning how to, you know, understand autism and understand Rosa more. 
I think you did a great job with Rosa. Deandre it's, it's, and Maria it's, touch your shoulders. Oh, here's Papa. You did a great job with her. And you see the change? Oh, sí. Ha cambiado mucho, pero esa es mi meta, que ella siga independizándose cada día más. Por eso es muy importante, sobre todo para los padres, tratarnos de instruirnos cada día más, para poderlos ayudar cada día más a ellos. So she's saying she's seen a lot of changes with Rosa, and that, you know, her main priority is just being able to help her be more independent. So she, you know, she hopes that other parents who have children with autism are able to become more knowledgeable so that they're able to help them. And so she was saying when she, before she got our support, um, she was working with one of our intake coordinators and um, that moment in time, that's where Rosa's behavior was the most challenging and where she didn't really understand because she didn't have the proper resources. So mm -hmm. now that she, you know, she's learning these things and with her experiences, she's she's just very grateful that she's been able to. Did a great job. Don't worry, you did a great job. I'm happy for you. At the case review, Sharon. I know that uh, Rosa's mother feels a lot more engaged in her education um, because of the work that you've been doing with her and has really expressed feelings of be feeling far more accomplished in terms of now she's able to navigate some of these things on her own. She's no longer relying on, on Deandra. So her capacity to kind of navigate the school system and navigate the medical system and interact and relate with all um, the people who are supporting Rosa has definitely increased. Deandra. Especially when Rosa was expressing suicidal ideation, she felt overwhelmed she would cry most of the time but now she's um she has hope Un bloque más. Clara and Rosa walk together y holding hands she takes her time with Rosa so that Rosa is able to thrive and learn from her no hay problema. Seguro. she's an excellent okay. teacher and supporter of Rosa directed and produced by Dan Habib Executive Producers, Joan B. Beasley, Karen L. Weigley. Edited by James Rutenbeck. Assistant Editor, Francisca Blome. Filmed by Dan Habib. Production Assistants, Lindsay Alsop, Karen Clausen. Sound and Color Finishing, Eric Masanaga, Shannon Mignaldi at Modulus. Special thanks to the staff of NY Start Region 4 Richmond Kings, Rosa Nieves and Clara Casas, Hawthorne Country Day School, Tawara Good, Dan Tomasulo. This film was funded by the Center for Start Services at the University of New Hampshire Institute on Disability. More information at www.centerforstartservices.org. Copyright 2020 Center for Start Services. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that segment. That one always gets me. Um, just lovely story. Um, so we're going to do the same thing we've done with the past two segments is break into your little groups again, your discussion groups, um, and talk about this portion of the film. Um, just want you guys to talk about what you observed, um, any of the strategies you observed, are there anything anything you used in the past to develop cohesion and movement and working with systems of support? So maybe not just what you've seen, but what you've done that's been successful. Um, and how did those strategies also impact the individual person that um, you were supporting? And have you used reframing in your work? And what were the related outcomes that you saw? And of course, again, the same question, what situations might you use this film with whom to achieve what? So we're gonna go into our breakout groups and come back and report back. Great, thanks Karen. Again, for those who are in the main room, just um, do not click join for the room you're assigned and you'll stay in the main room and be with your group.
Here we go. Thank you. Look at that. Hi, Heidi. Oh, I can't hear you. You're muted. I'm on mute. <laughs> so Brian's video was shut off. Okay. I you can't turn it back on. Yeah, it can't Okay, back here on. we go, Brian. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have any issues? Me or uh, audio video? Everybody good? I think we're good. Okay. Thank you. A bit. They must. How are we doing in the main room? Do we have any? Participants here? I didn't yes. get to get an invite to go back to my group. I didn't either. Oh, okay. so some of you need to go back to your other, okay. All right. We can get an invite. Okay, so I see Shannon first. What group were you in? Seven. Okay, give me one second and I Thank will do. And I'm, I'm Jose, I was in group eight. Okay, here you go. I'm Lindsay, I was in group seven. Lindsay, okay. Lindsay Brady? Yes. Okay, group seven, here you go. Anybody uh, else? Stanley, I was in group one. I'm sorry, what was, what was the first name? Stanley. Okay. So yeah, I was in group one. Okay, here you go, group one. Anybody else? Yes, this is Deanne Brown, and I don't recall the group that I was initially in. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Let's see if I can see where you were. If I can figure it out for you. Still looking to see if I can find your name. I apologize for having you go through that for me. That's okay, that's okay. I am not seeing it. So for whatever reasons, it did not put you back in the room. So do you mind just staying in this group for this last segment? Yes, ma'am, that's absolutely fine. Okay, great. I see Donna still here. Anyone else in this main group? participating I'm still uh I'm still here oh hi okay great hi Dave I'm here as well okay all right then I will let you guys get to work let me know if you need anything I I have a question okay yes. I I was actually gone from uh, noon to just now. So I, I didn't see the movie that probably everybody else saw. Is, is there a link online where I could see it? 
Yes, yes, you can go to the Center for Start Services website and um, just click on the start film and you can watch it from beginning to end. Absolutely. Okay. If you go to, do you know the link to our uh, materials page that we've been sharing? Yeah. Okay, if you go to there, it's also on there as well. Okay. All right, and I see Becca, okay. Got a message from Becca. You need to go to group eight. Okay. Okay, so they we're going through, do we have the questions? Dave, I'll, I'll post them in the chat for everyone. Oh, okay, thank you. You guys can see the chat, so I'll post them right now. There you go. Hopefully you can all see the chat. So what are some of the strategies that we observed uh, or used in the past to develop cohesion and movement in working with systems of support? Does so anyone want to take a stab at that one? Yeah, I'll go. Uh, this is David. Yeah, I think I like the way they brought everybody on board. Um, they brought the parents, the school, and also the professionals that were there, psychologists, everybody was involved. And uh, I think by working as a team, they came up with solutions that seem to have really worked uh, for the individual being supported. And, uh, and also I like that uh, everybody in the team was really focused on um, not, just the, uh, not just the individual students, but also how to support the parents and the staff that were working with the, with the individual. So it kind of appeared that they had most of everything that kind of touches her life, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the school or certainly big parts of her life and then uh, the other professionals that worked with them. Great, they really did. This is Donna, something that stood out to me with this video was about the mother. Um, it, to me, it felt like PERMA was being used for the mother first. And then when she understood um, just for the fact that she probably had been dealing with this for so many years and it took her a while to understand there was hope for her to be able to enjoy spending time outside of the home with her daughter. Um, I think it helped both of them equally. I mean, it always does, but I mean, this in this particular case, um, you could see hope just evolving with her mother and the daughter. 
Yeah, I, and sometimes they'll refer to that as uh, giving oxygen, bringing oxygen. You know, we don't really know what we're going to do yet. Mm -hmm. but there's someone here. You're not mm -hmm. alone, or whatever. Yes, that's, that was just so. Um, I don't know. It was. I love all the videos, but I think in this situation, just the help that the mother. Um, God, that brought even emotionalism to her when she tried to talk about it, how it moved her emotionally, just to have that um, look, kind of light at the end of the tunnel. I thought that was really just um, a special part of the video was let, letting us see that um, vulnerability of the mom being willing to step outside of the box of being in the house and just dealing with all the things that she had dealt with that she was losing hope. And then when they stepped out, to go to the store and they were holding hands and she looked at her daughter it was like she was examining her face like this is kind of different than what we're used to um that i don't know it just it was real moving this video was just real different in that aspect yeah i would just like to piggyback off of donna um i believe the caregiver support um within that was very very important and i think that they focused um, a lot on not only on um, the member or the person being served, but also their support system. Um, and I think that a lot of times we tend to overlook um, the fact that the support system of those members need just as much attention and training and support as the member themselves. I was also thinking about the geographic area where she was from. If I went to visit there right now, even being, you know, from a smaller town, um, I think that would be, you know, <laughs> looking around like, where should I go first? You know, I think that was part of what she dealt with. It was so busy and loud that she had to come to terms with the fact that she was going to be safe in that street or out, outside um, and I think that safety I think that came from inside of her I can't really say that anybody could have prepared her for that so there was a lot of growth in what they were doing with her um, you could see the growth as far as how she looked out at the traffic when she walked outside you, it didn't look like she was in a panic I thought that was a good uh, a good thing to to consider where she was from So I think we just got the two minute warning. I believe that there were, hi everybody, I'm Deandra. Um, I believe that there were a lot of strengths in the system um, from the beginning, especially with Rosa's mother. But however, she needed that empowerment um, in order to bring them strength, her strengths out so that she could better serve Rosa.
Welcome back, everybody. Everyone's rejoining the main session, and we're going to get started with our large group discussion in just a minute. I like the Christmas lights. Love that. All right, everybody is back from the breakout rooms. Okay, thanks. All right, guys. So there's been, there are four groups that we haven't heard from. So I'm gonna call on you guys this time. Um, the first one is the group with no name. <laughs> or no number the do we call it ground zero the, yeah the main or, room the main room thank you like what do I call you people I don't know the name of your group is somebody available to report back to us anyone from the main room still here um, let me see. Um, this is Donna Stevens. Yeah. Um, hey, we had talked about um, several things that had to do with um, this video, but one of the things that we all noticed was just the hope that it gave the mother. And um, David noticed how, or had mentioned how um, it was almost like oxygen that she was like, give me a breath of fresh air here. Yeah. And, um, and that was the, that was basically what I noticed up front was just um, all the other videos, it was kind of the spotlight of the individual. And this was, the mom was equally uh, on the spotlight as far as her body actions, her uh, emotionalism, different things. But um, so we were talking about the hope and, and like you said, the oxygen that it gave the mom. And another thing we had discussed was how when they, um, they were in the house a lot in the area, the, the geographic area that sh they were from, um, it had to be uh, really vulnerable for her to step out of that house and see that street and, and know that, you know, she's afraid of noise and it, and it makes her anxious, but you could just see a hope on her face and her mother's face when they went outside and went to the store and um, just really evolved into being more secure and more confident. Um, I think that's everyone agreed on that. And um, so it was, this was a very uplifting video. All of them have been, but I think that there was a spiral it, in the beginning with the mother and the tears and then you could just see them taking that one step at a time to look you know at the top of the staircase and see there was hope and that was uh, what we noticed <laughs> oh what a beautiful interpretation of that that's really neat what a great insight um but it, yes that is that is kind of um, even if across longer time than was videoed that is kind of the journey that they were on um yeah, it was pretty astounding because I think, I think De I saw Deandra on here earlier, her name on here, but I thought that I remembered that Rosa hadn't left the apartment like to do anything besides school for six months or something um, before they were involved. And at the beginning when they were involved before they got things worked out and treated her depression. So um, it was pretty significant, especially for a single mother um, her father is involved, but he doesn't live in the same apartment. So a mother, brother, and and Rosa living in that house together, it was hard for her mother to get things done. Um, so yeah, it made a really big, a really big difference for them. So thank you for that. Um, group number five. Hello there, this is Anthony here from California Start. I'll be speaking for my group. And hello. Um, 
when we were talking about the first questions, the strategies to develop cohesion and movement, it ended up, it was a discussion from our experience um, as clinicians are working in the field, uh, the ER situations that occur and the need for um, advocacy and support in an ER. And an example would um, was provided by one of our members was here was the um, face sheet would be provided to ambulance to provide information that they would need to support the individual. It would follow them to the emergency room, but then it would get lost when they end up in acute care somewhere. So then that opened up the discussion um, in the context of the question, how to develop cohesion and movement. Well, that's where we were thinking outreach would possibly happen and connecting in that in that link right there and strengthening that to ensure that the individual um, has their needs met in that experience um, fully. Uh, the other component of that was um, looking at uh, linkage agreements for training and advocacy um, in situations where there may be um, schools or ERs where um, there, there are challenges with access or clients um, or individuals struggling in those situations. And then we had reframing and some of the reframes that came up were from that question, um, when, when someone is um, being called demanding, um, well, that's also, there's assertion there and they know what they want, they're persistent. Mm -hmm. um, and then also instead of um, not following directions, they're not compliant, um, there's possible leadership capability there. Mm -hmm. and, then, um, and then using that language in all settings and sharing that with others to, to look at um, the behavior as the behavior, in, as the behaviors are reported as the problem, but we're trying right. to look at the individual no, there. No, but you're yeah. right, right? Because the, you saw the teacher even using those terms. And this is after yep. Deandra and her team have worked with the school for, you know, several months and, and really mm -hmm. helped to, you're right, reframe. That's exactly what, what they did. That's great. And then the situations uh, where the film would be useful, um, I thought it was a, we, we were talking about it being a good example of, of coaching in action. Mm -hmm. And um, also, so to show what coaching would look like. And then also um, the, uh, the rolling out of the diagnoses, of the behavioral diagnoses and really focusing in and finding out uh, the, there was depression and it needed to be treated. And then that became the, the focus of the treatment there, um, which in, improved the symptoms all in all. Um, I, as, as a new start program, I haven't seen it in action, but I, we're all familiar now with the paperwork and, and um, how to look at the diagnoses, how to prioritize them. But to see that component of it in action, that was really helpful um, from my perspective, so. Yeah, yeah. And we, I mean, we got to see them talk about it. We obviously hadn't been there the previous several months where Deandra kept going to the psychiatric appointments with Mrs. Casas and Rosa um, and, and building that relationship before they actually got enough of a relationship with that provider to have them talk to their medical director um, directly and talk about diagnostics and medication. Um, mm to influence that, yeah. There was, I also liked how it steps. came from the yeah. school too, from the, the reporting of her mood mm -hmm. at school and consistently reporting. And then there was, I believe if I, if I remember correctly, there was a lot of sadness reported. Um, and then they used that to, as part of the data to collect, to bring it to the clinical staffing. Yes, yep, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, and, and one thing that I really, I guess now that I'm thinking about it, it's not on the film. But one thing I loved about the school that I guess we should have, maybe we can clip it in. Hey, Dan. Um, but there's the school now, when you walk in, the, the ramp right here, right in front of you is a strength spotting board. And the entire school uses it. And they put up sticky notes each day for different kids, or a kid can do one for a teacher to read um, something that somebody noticed that day of somebody doing something well. So it's, it's pretty cool. It was a, it was pretty dramatic change. So thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Um, group three, where are you? 
Well, hi, Karen. Well, hi, Andy. How are you? Uh, um, so group three, well, we uh, started out talking about some of the uh, the uh, efforts at, at cohesion we had experienced in, in the courses of our respective careers. And, and we talked about some of those things you'd be familiar with from the past, the team building. Uh, we currently have a lot of person-centered facilitation, but these things in the, in the system as they've been practiced, we've typically only been able to pull in families if we're lucky, um, and the, uh, the, the, the persons who are paid supports within one funding stream. So we don't often get all the, the particularly the clinicians involved who, who are funded through managed care organizations. Um, yeah. Yeah. We, ha we have uh, used you know, cross system, uh, cross system crisis plans. Mm -hmm. um, but again, in the planning process, we don't often have the buy-in of, of some of those entities outside of our funding stream. What, what of course, was a great source of, uh, of cohesiveness uh, or facilitating that that was observed in, in the video is the, the case consultations because mm -hmm. that sort of, at least from a perspective seemed to be, well, here's where we need to build those and that, uh, that, that uh, the the coordinator kind of is the person who's out there yes. building that web a, a spider of sorts. Um, <laughs> and, I, thought, I like it. Yeah, They're spiders and okay. and, and c connecting everyone. And that was um, as far as some of the work on the uh, the the strategies that were used. Uh, were just really cool. It was, you could, particularly with the mom, um, you could see the, the involvement of, of the coordinator just kind of doing the, the, uh, the, the strength activation of, mm -hmm. of the mom's strengths that had been spotted, uh, affirming a lot of the, uh, uh, of the mom's accomplishments. Um, you know, it, yeah. it, it, it was, uh, it was, it was very touching, but it was also that, that physical contact, mm -hmm. you know, kind of helped, helped kind yes. of uh, establish that web with her. Um, but it nice. also boosted the mom's confidence. I mean, it, 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 it seemed pretty apparent. Mom had been very, very unsure of herself, but, mm -hmm. but that was, that was growing and then there were of course all the connections uh developed with the school um and then as far as the reframing uh yeah we just we observed a lot of that in the in the changes of of the language um just kind of going from the negative to to framing it in more a, a positive manner in uh in what I, I guess, in a sense, creating a new baseline mm -hmm. using using the strength spotting. So knowing what we're going to build upon rather than what we're trying to get rid of, because yep. what we're trying to get rid of doesn't tell us what what we want to do. It just tells us what we don't want to do, mm -hmm. um, and you know. Uh, there may be some of us out there who have gone into a job at one time or another, and we're told, "Here's what not to do." But, yeah, if you're not <laughs> told what. And uh, then, as far as how might this uh, the, the situations that we'd use this film, we didn't get that far. You didn't get that part. That's okay. No. I know we we had it was a little bit shorter of a time. Yeah. So that's okay. That's Thank okay. You. Thank you, Andy. It's so good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And last but certainly not least, we have group nine. I've been keeping track and ticking off all the numbers, I promise.
Um, so our group, group nine, um, you guys hear me all right? Yeah, it's great. Good. Great, so our group, group nine, um, we spoke about a couple of things um, in terms of strategies to develop cohesion and movement in working with the system of support. Um, one person in our group was talking about uh, the importance of considering all parts of a system, uh, including systems of support uh, that exist in the community, for example, police or EMT. Um, so uh, systems in the community that support, for example, residents um, uh, may include, you know, the police or EMT um, and even, you know, uh, ensuring that um, if police assistance is needed, that um, one creative uh, a solution or strategy was to develop a sheet um, uh, for each resident or each individual um, that included their diagnosis and also some of their strengths or interests. And this is so as to really, uh, to be to more appropriately inform uh, police or EMT of how to relate to that individual uh, in crisis. We also spoke about um, um, language and the use of perhaps like a translator and the importance of not leaving a critical member um, of the system out of the loop or out of conversations or meetings simply because of a language barrier. And that um, if we really want to develop cohesion in the system of support, that efforts need to be made to include a parent or a caregiver, um, even if that means uh, they don't speak English. Uh, and that could look like using a translator, having a multilingual team, or other creative options like using text versus uh, uh, voice calls. And lastly, in terms of another strategy, it kind of ties on you know, strength spotting as well as PERMA, and specifically building strength spotting muscle, that building that strength spotting muscle um, uh, as a strategy uh, for promoting this type of cohesion. Um, it really, and not only building uh, spot, uh, strength spotting, but also incorporating the five pillars of PERMA in all interactions with the individual and the system. Um, and I think that one part of this includes as a strategy, uh, really being intentional about engaging a vocabulary of strength rather than maintaining the status quo as it relates to uh, like a domination of deficit talk. I think that these are great strategies that will help develop the cohesion um, in working with a system of support in our team, what we thought. That's great. Gosh, you had quite a list there, um, but it <laughs> really good. And it seems like a lot of what you focused on, uh, even around the cultural competence part is language, right? And how important it is to ensure that we have a common understanding of the person. And, and as a start team member, it's your job to shift that common understanding from aggressive and bossy to um, a leader might have some depression, but also has a real appreciation for beauty and excellence too. So how do we use those things? It, it's again, I know I said this earlier, but, and I think you've said it too, is that's how you create opportunity, right? So that people can see, and pe everybody mentioned this a lot today too, the hope, where it gives you hope to actually think about a different solution. If you just continue to say she's been aggressive and it just keeps getting worse and we just don't know what to do, you sort of go, oh, well, me neither, you know? <laughs> um, you know, but when you start thinking about what's going well and her leadership and playing into that and giving her a role with that so she feels better, right? When we capitalize on those strengths, people suffer less. And when you suffer less and you feel better, you'll have fewer of the problems you had. I know it's not all there is to it, but it it's a great place to start and it's a great way to begin to shift everybody's perception. So I love how you outlined all those pieces. Thank you. Nice, nice conversation. I think um, really interesting. I wish I could have been a fly on the wall in many of these groups to hear more about your discussions, but it's, it's obvious that um, 
we have a very um, cohesive group in, in here um, who are focusing on positives and, and the strength spotting, uh, PERMA, those aspects. And um, just, I think it's, it's kind of a nice ending to this series that we're ending on this again, because we started with this and we kind of went through some of the other parts about start. We've um, talked about other aspects of the things we do, cultural competency, how they're all tied together. And I feel like the films are the culmination of that, right? To show you how all those different sort of philosophical pieces that Mickey was talking about, right? Is what does it mean for action and how does it actually impact change in behavior ourselves and others, right? Um, and how do we improve people's lives? So um, thank you guys so much for being here with us again today and for sticking it out. I know it's three days. Um, hopefully it's worth it for all of you. I know we have loved having you. Thank you so much. And oh, one last reminder, this, these videos will be available and are available on the Center for Start Services website. You can watch them at any time. I'm sure you just want to like go to sleep to them, right? Every night. <laughs> but what I mean is they're there for you to use. You can show those, use them um, to help teach others about some of these strategies, whether you're part of a start team or not. Um, if you want to introduce some of these ideas to your teams and make it real and concrete, please do use these. So thank you very much. I think Beth has last little bit. Well, of course, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Wigley, for facilitating such a wonderful session today. I'd like to thank all of our attendees today for engaging and participating and really diving into this uh, and bringing your best selves. I'd also like to thank the Center for Start Services Ops team for uh, mm -hmm. providing all of the behind the scenes support uh, and coordination to make this uh, event smooth and successful. So thank you all. Um, the evaluation link is in the chat and will be emailed to you. Continuing ed credits are available on the website right at the top. You can download a certificate of attendance and we will be emailing a link for an overall evaluation tomorrow. We will also email participants when the recordings of this three-day session are available for you to download and share. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Happy holidays. Take care. And thank you, Beth. Thank you.